in a moment. All right. So welcome to another episode of Music, Philosophy, and More. I'm your host, John Henry Sheridan, and today I have a special Brooklyn born and bred guest, Chris Bonica. How you doing? All right. What's going on, John? Very good. Very good. I'm glad to have you on the show. I've been wanting to for a while. And uh, so here we are. We made it happen. Um, so just before we got started, uh, Chris and I were talking about coffee and uh, and uh, bodily um, challenges. Yeah. <laughs> so, so maybe we'll get to that um, in the near future. But uh, I think we're going to start off with uh, some music talk. But uh, just for our for our guest today, uh, for our listening audience, um, is there anything you'd like to share about yourself, Chris, in terms of getting letting people know who you are? Uh, so, as you said, uh, Brooklyn, Brooklyn born, uh, Brooklyn native. Um, still live in Brooklyn. I haven't I haven't fled like a lot of the other people. Um, I've been playing drums for since nineteen ninety. Eight, I think. What is that? Twenty-three years. Twenty-three mm. years. Uh, yeah. Played in a lot of, you know, rock metal bands uh, in the in the area. Um, work in Manhattan. Yeah, I mean, it sums me up. <laughs> cool. Um, all right. So just saying hi to Lou. I see uh, our friend Lou Larocco. Louis Larocco is tuning in. So uh, yeah, Lou, um, I'm sure you'll be both supporting us and heckling us at the same time. So thank you for being here. Uh, <clears throat> so Chris, um, can you remember, actually, you know what, before we go into a question, one thing I like to ask uh, a guest on the show is, can you remember the first time we met, if possible? Because I don't think I could put a specific story together. I'm wondering if you have anything no, I don't specific. know the first time we met, but I know the first time I saw you. <laughs> okay. um, so you knew my sister before you knew me. Right. Um, and I think she was playing a concert in Madison and you had uh, your own guitar part. And I, I remember you on stage and you had this fiery mane. And your guitar <laughs> playing, and it, it was it was awesome, <laughs> really awesome. And I that's think that's funny. the first time. And then someone said, "Oh, that's John Henry," and I was like, "Oh, okay." And uh, and it's the first time I, I I saw you. And then we've met somewhere in the neighborhood. I know that. Yeah, right. It's probably probably your first hanging out somewhere with mixed friends and Lou, I imagine. But yeah, but maybe some other context. I know we got to know each other later on as you were playing with Lou and hanging out with Lou and I was friends with Lou and we just kind of bonded as, you know, just right. fellow guys in the in the neighborhood. So, um, all right, cool. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you any more specifically how we first met. You just kind of emerged into my life, you know, as a presence in the late 90s, you know. Yeah. And, and you know, like you said, I was friends with your sister. So you were kind of there in the periphery you know right um so all right um so can you remember what it was that got you to enjoy music in the first place i think it's my dad uh so my dad was always a rock guy beatles you know he was always trying you know always playing beatles and and um traveling woolberries he got me into the traveling woolberries and that was they were so cool um and he was, he was really into rock. And one day, I remember it was the, the mid-90s, early 90s. And he says to me, have you heard this new group on, on the rock station? And at the time, I, you know, I, was, I was young. I, wasn't, I didn't know what music I liked. You know, it was like new kids on the block. And I, I, I didn't know what I liked. You know, I was probably 12 or 13 at the time. And he goes, check this song out. And he put, so, oh, so he puts on the radio. And finally, the song came on because it kept on playing it. It was uh, K Rock, and K Rock was good. And um, the song that came on was "Lithium" by Nirvana. And he's like, "I love this song." Wow. And 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 uh, so I'm listening to the song. I'm like, "Yeah, the song's actually really good." I remember that like really sparked my interest in music. Just you know, just listening and, and just the bond 
uh, mm-hmm. over music and uh, as you know like music just bonds people in general but um that was like my first big foray into like something that i really liked in music yeah that, that's pretty amazing that it was your dad who said check out lithium you yeah. know that not i don't think too many uh young boys would have that experience at that time maybe now like you know people who grew up with that music would say to their kids listen to this but that he would be into it at the same time is pretty cool yeah um was he a big fan of music or he is he he is he always he wished that he played guitar he you know he in fact uh growing up he had wanted me to play guitar um and he was like you know it's something that i i really regretted not doing um you know, one of his favorite things to do is just put on a record and, and, you know, sit down and listen or while he's doing stuff around the house, just play music. He loves music, mm-hmm. you know, so I think that's where I get it from. My mom loves music, too. My mom's one of her favorite bands was Frank Zappa. So, wow. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. So you have a lot of support there. Yeah. Yeah. Between the both of them. That's that's amazing. Yeah. Well, isn't that quite, you know, it's this old like. um uh i don't know hobby or i won't say a lost art but almost like um where people would take an album and say okay i'm gonna listen to music now and it was an activity like you know you know you know i don't think people would put in their schedule back then but you just like okay this is my music time and you just go put on the album you sit and listen to it like actively listen when was the last time you ever did that or do you uh i still do i'll put on so i really appreciate not only do I appreciate music, but I appreciate when something's really recorded well. So like so, like an album I feel that's really done well, like th- not only the playing, but like the recording of it is like Fleetwood Mac Rumors. Like that album, you, I could sit down and just listen to it. You close your eyes and you could like hear the instruments all around the room, mm-hmm. you know, and, and it's just, to me, it's magical. You know, I, I love it, you know. I don't know. Sure, sure. It. Yeah, I, I, I never got into that album that much, but I know it has uh, packs of punch. I'm aware of that, you know. Yeah. Um, a few albums that jump out to me like that. I'm one I, I'm sure we would agree on is uh, Typo Negatives October Rust. Oh yeah. yeah. That's a magical, magically recorded album. Mm-hmm. Uh, is it true that the drums were uh, not real drums? I think I heard that somewhere. Unfortunately. So I believe he would play the drums. They do like a two track live with the drums. And then um, who's the key, uh, the keyboard player. He would, he would then program them. I'm sure Lou will chime in if he's still in the chat, and, <laughs> but then they would be programmed. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, either way, man, it, it, it is so, so, probably better for the programming because it it was just sounds more it's very controlled very composed album right Mm -hmm. so i guess most drummers or maybe in rock drummers i don't know if it's fair to say may not think in terms they wouldn't think the same way a keyboardist would right so keyboardist or whoever was doing the programming would have a more thorough you know conception perhaps instead of like the emotional in the moment thing of a drum i don't know perhaps uh so Lewis, Lou chimed in and Lou says, yes, used to really sit, focus and study. It was an experience without distraction. The album artwork, lyrics, song into song into song were an experience. Right. Yeah. Like that. I, I listen to albums now. I, I, I mean, for the longest time, I never really gave that up. Um, I actually have a huge record collection, not that I bought, that I just acquired just sort of through my, the nature of my life. And I listen to Frank Sinatra. I listen to italian opera whatever i have that i accumulate i'll just put it on and the flow of that whole musical expression from beginning to end whether i like it or not i i I at least i give it at least one playthrough you know and i just absorb it and then sometimes i'll just find a record that sounds great of course i do this with music that i more actively choose too and uh yeah there's something about having you know if you think about did you were you a fan of uh Metallica's Ride the Lightning, for example. Of course, yeah. So, I mean, can you remember the order of the songs? I certainly can. And Probably, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it depends on like where you were in life when, when it hits you, but I, I, mean, I remember the order and one leads into the other and it was, I'm sure they spent time thinking about how that was going to be. Mm-hmm. 
you know, same with, you know, most albums up until, I, I don't know when that stopped, if it, if it stopped, but yeah. Uh, what's another album that, that jumps out at you as being super well recorded unless you um, had something else? Not, not super well recorded, but like an album that I could get completely lost into um, uh, would, would have to be super unknown, Soundgarden. Where like, <laughs> There's, there's, there's a lot that goes on in their songs. And, and at the same time, you can remember every, like, you know, all the drum fills, you know, where the guitar licks are coming in or, you know, the little bass melodies, you know, and, and you can just listen to that album and just get lost into it, you know, and, and it's great. It's just s such an amazing listenable al album, you know? Yeah. I, mm -hmm. Okay. You know, Lou, our friend Lou, uh, also mentioned to me kind of sold preached to me about the merits of super unknown when we were playing in level six together and yeah. uh i stubbornly eventually gave in I, ca I can't say it's one of my favorite albums by any means but i do kind of regard it as their best album uh anyway i want to just uh get to Lou's comment which was i think it's a big reason why vinyls are coming back uh they force you to listen all the way through and really absorb the presentation the packaging right so when i'm putting on a vinyl i'm usually i'm writing you know doing some research or something and i just i'm not gonna stop it you know it's, mm -hmm. it's too much work but when it's a button it's a totally different thing so the vinyl is uh is a good way to trap you into the whole album experience even a cassette is too a cassette's a bit different and for some reason it's not coming back i kind of wish it was i listen i've been listening to cassettes all afternoon actually um and lou says ha 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 super unknown was not just an album it was a spiritual experience <laughs> Believe would, it or not, would you would you go that far chris a spiritual experience i, I think so it, so it's the first sound garden album i heard but it's not my favorite sound garden album um probably bad motor finger and, and Probably my favorite Soundgarden song is probably Slaves and Bulldozers, which is on Bad Motor Finger. But, hmm. um, just, but that album, it's the first one I heard. I had it on cassette. I think I played the cassette so much I wore it out. Uh, <laughs> I probably still have it. Um, there's a few albums I wore out on cassette. Smash set was, by The Offspring was another one where I could listen to that album over and over and over again. Hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, the album's just, it's just an incredible, well-written album, you know. Bad, bad Motor Finger or, uh, or, or uh, Super Unknown? Super Unknown. Mm -hmm. It just takes you on like this roller coaster ride from being like somewhat depressed to really depressed to somewhat depressed again, so mm -hmm. yeah. Um, all right, cool. So we, we could obviously go on this trail for hours, but I wanna go back to you. Um, so some of your early inspirations, hanging out with your dad, listening to Nirvana on the radio. What caused you to get involved with music and say, hey, I want to actually do this myself? Uh, so growing up, I did want to play guitar as my dad had wanted. However, I know that when I was a little, little kid, little three, four years old, I was I was banging on my mom's pots and pans. I'm sure a lot of kids do this with, with, with the wooden spoons, right? You're banging on the pots and pans with wooden spoons. And I had gotten to try a drum set. Uh, there was someone we both know and lived in the neighborhood, um, Jay. And I got to try his drum set. And I just, I loved it. I loved sitting behind the kit. It's, it's a very, um, what's the word? It's, it, I don't want to say it's like a sexual thing, but like there's, there's like a romantic thing. It's all analog, right? It's, it's, it's just. You touch every part of it, right? And yeah. heads. And you, there's a billion different ways you can play them. You know, you just don't have to hit this, the head in the middle of the drum. There's a million different ways you can play each drum or hi-hat or cymbal, you know, and it, it's like a very romantic personal instrument and um i loved it hmm. and, and i and I, I just wanted to do it so that's cool i uh, i'm fascinated to hear that i definitely never heard it described like romantic or the skins of the heads i mean i could see that uh i love the being behind a kit too it's it's like a whole world it, it i could spend hours and hours and days and weeks there 
Mm -hmm. um, I played a so, show. Well, sorry. Yeah, I played please. a show once, and it was in a skate park. And um, we were playing, the band played in front of, oh, there was like some kind of skate thing behind us, but nobody was like a, a half pipe, but nobody was skating on the half pipe because the bands were playing in front of it. But there was people sitting on the ledge behind me. And we had this one song where I'm using, I'm, it's like a very tribal beat and I'm using, I got my double bass going, but my left foot is half on the double pedal and half on the hi-hat. I'm hitting all the toms, the snare drum, and I've, I'm also using the ride cymbal and the floor tom. And so someone who's been to our shows a hundred times was like, I didn't, she goes, I can't see you back there and what you're doing. Sometimes it doesn't look like you're doing anything. Right. <laughs> right. I just see your head, right? <laughs> right. And she goes, I didn't know you were doing all those things like at one time. I was like, oh, because she saw you from behind. From behind. That's and I was awesome. like, I was like, yeah, I said, you, you know, the drummer really, you know, it's, <laughs> you're using five limbs, right? You're using your feet, your hands, and everything's being controlled by your head, right? So mm -hmm. uh, it's, it, it's, it's like a workout sometimes. And, and it's, you know. Totally, yeah, totally is. I think that that's one thing that distinguishes me from, from a, a real drummer is uh, that I just don't have the physical capacity to sustain things for more than five, 10 minutes. I could do a lot of things together. I can, I can coordinate it but I just can't sustain it because I've never worked out. You know, that's what practice is for. And all those hours that a, a drummer puts in, you know, I can compute it mentally, but uh, I can't sustain it. And I, that, therefore I feel like I'm not a, a real drummer, you know, but so, that, you know, some of the best like funk drumming, uh, like Steve, like Stevie wonder, Stevie wonder. Right? Yeah. He, I know he's blind, but he would actually sit behind the kit and play like, if he had ideas, play it. And, and, and his, his playing was, was unbelievable because he f didn't think like a drummer. He thought more like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, either a pianist, whatever he was, you know, whatever he was thinking of at that time. So you don't have to necessarily be a drummer uh, to have those really good ideas. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Just like you say, uh, was it Josh who programmed the, the drums for the typo yeah. album? So Mark Hamill chimed in and says, uh, um, I just had to stalk Facebook to uh, so many people to find would find our stream. Thank you, Mark Hamill, for doing that. Thanks. You're awesome. And uh, Lou says that Chris loves drums because he likes banging things like a primate. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably true. Um, uh, <laughs> I know. He would always say I looked like... Uh, He's like, you look huge. He would always say, you look huge behind the drum set. And I was just like, I don't know what you mean by it. He's like, you're just smashing things. <laughs> That's what he would always say. Yeah, no, I, whenever I saw you play, I didn't. I don't know how many times I saw you play live, but in, in, in the studios and stuff, I always it was a pleasure to watch you play. Uh, the way you, you're a good player, but also you love the drums, which it was evident to me. So that always excites me to see someone who wants to play their instrument, you know, mm -hmm. and especially the drums. I think the drums... You have those people that love drums, but a lot of times, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I've seen a lot of drums that don't actually love it. You know, they're just kind of there for the ride or for some other reason, not because of the pure love for the music. So, yeah, that was that was fascinating. Yeah, you, you get that. Uh, I've had conversations with uh, people who are into it for other reasons than the music, uh, which is disappointing, but. And it wasn't like they were bad drummers. They were good drummers, but mm -hmm. they could have, they probably could have been a lot better if like they were really into the instrument, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but it is yeah. what it is. Right. Everyone comes at it for a different reason. And, yeah. Uh, all right. So since we kind of jumped into some performance stories, um, can you share about, so what was your first band, if you don't mind, if it, whatever you feel comfortable with, what was your oh, gosh, trajectory of bands, whatever you, are willing to share and what was your yeah let's start there so what was your first band oh, or two or so three technically the my first band so remember I, I said that i played on that kid jay's drum set mm -hmm. following that it was his garage we all hung out in his garage mm -hmm. he kicked me out of his garage and was no longer allowed in there 
um, <laughs> because I had gotten a drum set and he, I guess he felt competition. Mm -hmm. So he kicked sure. me out. So as he was kicking me out, I told him, well, I'm going to steal your band. And I did. Um, <laughs> I started playing. Uh, I took his band. And, but that didn't last long. Those guys, I don't know. They weren't just, they were just, you know, they weren't really serious. Mm -hmm. So then I got into another band and, and they were called, I think they were like not adhesive glue or something. Um, and then mm -hmm. neighborhood friends, um, we, we formed a band and that was death threat. Um, and then from there, there was wicked adversary. Hmm. And I think after that, I got a, uh, I joined with Lou and Mr. Jack Frost. So, okay. So, so I think I recognized well besides Mr. Jack Frost, like two of the band names. So I must've just kind of heard it, you know, because I was, in the rock scene in the neighborhood and so are you so wicked what was it wicked uh wicked adversary wicked adversary i think i remember hearing the name i can't remember if i saw you guys live or not mm. unless you remember if i did but we oh you know we all played a show in jay's garage because he had that big two-car garage that we built the uh -huh. stage and <laughs> um i did i believe you guys played uh we played non-adhesive glue played because they got back together okay. and uh oh boy tom cummings uh, uh, uh oh god those guys play too vexed vexed yes wow. were they called vexed then or were they uh, called... no maniacal disciple maniacal disciple yes wow um so that sounds vaguely familiar the only memory i have of jay's garage is uh like we came in and we like raided a, a rehearsal. I don't know. I guess someone invited us to hang out there and we all just went there and someone offered you guys want to play a song and we, we played a song. I think Mark Frankel remembers the story, but um, I don't remember that sh a show, but I know, I know Jay's garage had this kind of unique studio, <laughs> mini, mini, very dangerous venue, right? Yeah. Because of how small it was, <laughs> but yeah, unique um, is, uh, is a good word. Yeah, yeah, but it was really kind of funky, cool place for, for young kids, you know, to be allowed to do that, you know. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. Uh, Lou says that I heard a legend once that Chris's chest hair grows in the shape of a palm tree because when he is shirtless, it is pure paradise. <laughs> Can you speak to that, Chris? <laughs> uh, not a palm tree, but he's, he's getting close. Not a palm tree. So I'm guessing when you guys were playing together, he got uh, a glimpse of uh, something heavenly that uh, I can only dream of. Yeah. So when I was when I was younger, I always we go to the studio. The studios like fast lanes. You couldn't breathe in them. They didn't have a fan. There was they had an AC that was probably 50 years old, and so I used to take my shirt off all the time. You know. So <laughs> we got, That's great. We got pretty uh, intimate in those uh, yeah. those rehearsals. <laughs> All right, so let's, so non adhesive glue. Um, I don't remember who was in that, but I definitely remember that name. What kind of music was that? They were grunge. Grunge, yeah, okay. Grunge. Sean Darcy, I remember that. Jay. So yeah, that was uh, Jay's band. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. All right, and um, then Wicked Adversary. And what kind of music were you guys? Well, we were metal, mm -hmm. a metal band. Yeah. Right. And then, so then after that comes, uh, there was a, was a death threat. You said there was something in there. Death threat was before wicked adversary. I think we changed the name when we, we swapped some members. Okay. It was pretty mm -hmm. much the same band, but yeah. So here's a question that, uh, I think I know the answer to, but I might be surprised. Do any of these demos exist floating in the internet somewhere? No. Mm. Uh, but I may have some of them on tape. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, no, no pressure to put it out, but for <laughs> me, I, I found that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very particular about a lot of music I was involved with, I composed, you know, so anyway, so I'm been putting out old demos on YouTube and it's not like there's a voracious appetite for them, but you know, if someone wants to hear this thing that I did, I can point them to it, which is kind of fun, you know? And I take a picture of the album artwork or like just even if it's just a cassette tape, I take a picture of it, maybe what the, the basement looked like at that time and put it up there. It's just fun because I think that 
experiences, you know, even though we may look back on those memories of playing in basements and garages and say, oh, it's no big deal. We were just kids or whatever, but uh, those times will very likely will never come again. Anything that, that was very unique to that time. So for people to be able to encounter that or experience it in some way, I think, you know, has value, if, if, if not, if nothing else, historical value, you know? Yeah, no, it does. Um, fun, funny enough, I've been digitizing like my photographs. I've always been into photography, um, been digitizing photographs and just throwing out the albums. And um, I have pictures from shows from bands I was in with Lou. Um, I think I have pictures from that show in Jay's Garage uh oh, i'd like to see that um and and it's 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 i don't know i think back to those times and they were a good learning experience because even now you know you're always learning even now like um i before pre-covid i was starting to play shows with my band and we're playing like all these bars these like little dive bars which i've done a hundred thousand times and, you know, so you know the routine, you know, you get there, get your stuff, set it up, put it in a corner, like mark your territory like a, like a cat or a dog. And, uh, mm -hmm. and that's your area. Um, and, and I guess I've just become so accustomed to that. You know, you think back to those days playing in like little garages and stuff and, you know, no one knew what was happening, what was going on, where to set up your stuff, how to plug your stuff in. And, mm -hmm. You know, it's very, very innocent, you know. Yeah. And, or no one knew where any of this was going or yep. or why it was so exciting, right? But that excitement was palpable, you know, back then. Um, yeah. And when I listen to the demos of my band in 96, 97, 98, I just hear like, of course, it's raw. Of course, it could be a lot more polished or whatever, but that sound you, is, you can't get it anywhere else. That sound is that sound, you know, nothing else sounds like that. So whether it sounds like Metallica or whatever, it makes no difference because that is a very unique expression of human beings at that time, at that place, you know, and uh, only in Brooklyn, you couldn't have gotten that somewhere else because right. the influences wouldn't have come together the same way, you know? Um, so can you share about, uh, including, so I guess Mr. Jack Frost comes and then I'm, I guess that's kind of like, is that your first serious band? Would you call it that? Or it was or not so, quite with Frost. So we was originally, the name was supposed to be on the inside. Really? Uh, the name, that's what the name was supposed to be. And then I think TJ got a show so i joined the band and then lou calls me up i remember working in key food lou calls me up and he's like hey he goes i got some news i'm like what's up he goes so we have a show and i'm like all right i just joined the band he goes it was like in 11 days uh <laughs> we're playing lamores with these bands and he uh since the guy knew tj from jack frost he booked the show underneath jack frost and I was, and he goes, do you have a problem with that? I said, no, I said, I have a problem with that. I got to learn all these songs in 11 days. So, um, uh -huh. that, I, you know, that was that, uh, I learned the songs, you know, we hit the studio probably eight times in those 11 days. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, we, we played uh -huh. the show at Lemoore's. Yeah. Hmm. Um, and then we were, we were in that band for, it had to be at least two years, three years. Yeah, I felt like that that lasted for a while. And yeah. uh, there was a, at least one pretty solid demo, right? Were, were there more? We did a demo uh, with, um, for, we did a two track live at Fast Lanes, but then we did a full demo at Electric Plant with Vinny. Cool. So, yeah. <laughs> Which I actually have the reel. I still have the half inch tape. Up yeah, in that, that I would like to see up on YouTube one day for the archives. That, you know, that just... I could do. I still have demo. Like I yeah. still have that demo. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I could share the way I do it. If you want to reference to see, I mean, you could obviously figure it out yourself, but uh, just as like, kind of like as this historical piece, like boom, this band existed. This is the, the music. Uh, I do the, the time uh, stamps mm -hmm. for each song instead of like cutting up and creating a video for each song. I just put it as an album or EP, whatever timestamps. And you could just, 
peruse it. And for anyone who was from that time period, they'd probably be happy to re-engage with that. Out. You know, yeah. I, I would think so. I remember those those demos. I definitely had them, uh, and I listened to them. I liked them. You know, no, they're good. Um, mm -hmm. I had the demo that had Justin on it. I thought that was fantastic. Um, and I have the demo we did at um, Electric Plant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I was glad we weren't with Vinny. I like his personality yeah. <laughs> uh, really helped in recording that. That was like the first time I think I recorded, you know, the full set of mics on a drum set. It was, it was, you know, uh, intimidating. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, but he, he has that way of that equanimity about him. Like I remember when I recorded, I mean, level six notices with him, but I, we did recordings like four years before the three or four years before level six, uh, with modus Tolens. Um, and he, uh, he would had this way cause you know, you were his customer, so he didn't want to lose you. So he's not going to tell you anything clearly negative, but he's not going to, to, he's not going to stroke your ego for no good reason. So like, if, if it's like, so what does it sound like? How, how do we sound? He's like, it sounds like music, you know, you know, he like, he yeah. would like say something safe. <laughs> it's like, it sounds like rock, you know? And then he would like find a way to, to tell you how to make it better. Of course, it's his opinion, not always the best idea, but when you factor it in, it just becomes, like I said, more, more balanced, maybe more, uh, you know, you could see a bigger, bigger picture. Yeah. You know, he was a producer in, in his own right. You know? Yeah. I remember um, during that session, I had a particularly tough time with one song that we were doing um, where the double bass pattern was supposed to follow. It might've been seven, six or one of the other songs in that album, double bass, like the guitar would do like one, two, three, two, three, or I forget how it went and double bass was supposed to follow it perfectly. And I just, uh, like deer in the headlights i just couldn't do it practice mm. was no problem so i think for the recording while they were doing that chunky heaviness i was literally just playing straight double bass like i and it might have been it might have been um a trip in a triplet pattern like you know mm. I, I think because i think the song is in six eight i might be wrong i don't remember mm. so yeah uh some I'm just look. I'm responding to Lou. He said that um, I miss Vincent. I hope he's doing well. And I'm gonna just say shout out to Vin Vincent and his uh, Facebook name is Vin Cinturino, I think. So I'm gonna. That's about right. Uh, yeah. Here we go. I'm gonna um, tag him. So hopefully he'll find this. Uh, yeah. We are, yeah, whenever Vin comes up in a conversation with any of us who work with him, it's always the same thing. I miss Vinny. How's he doing? You know, he was a great guy just to hang out with. You know? Oh, yeah. Uh, we at some point, uh, I don't know if it was, yeah, I guess I might have started when I in Modus Tones like 2000, 2001, but definitely by level six days in 2004, well, I was calling him Uncle Vinny. You know, and basically I would just refer to him as Uncle Vinny to, to whatever guys I was with because we all kind of saw him in that light, you know, mm -hmm. you know, the guy you could trust, but he also liked to party. He wasn't like, wasn't a father figure, right? Because he, he was, he would party too and have fun, but, right. but you could trust him. And he would like lay down the law when you're getting out of line, like don't bring clown food into electric plant. You remember that? Mm -hmm. He said McDonald's was clown food. <laughs> yeah, it was right across the street. <laughs> yeah, it must have sucked if you had to clean yeah. up this your garbage every time, right. you know? I'm sure, I'm sure, because people were slobs. You know, you'd walk into a room and people would leave their stuff all over the place. It's, you know, yeah. I, I get that now. Some, you know, I have my, I don't know if you could say I have my electronic drum set behind me, but like, you know, mm -hmm. if I want to go play on a real kit, um, there's a studio not far from here where you can rent the, you know, hourly solo rate, which is affordable enough. Um, and you walk into these rehearsal rooms and they try to keep the place nice, but you know, the last person who was in there left water bottles all over the place. or you know, they, they were smoking cigarettes and now there's butts all over the place. And, and it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's annoying, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's keep the place nice, you know? Right. Yeah. Why, why can't you keep it nice? You know, <laughs> and they have garbage. So they don't have garbage bales in the room or, or ashtrays they do, you know, and it, that is there for your convenience and, you know, you know, can't do it. Yeah. I guess it also has to do with um, 
the staff and and the the attitude the staff brings like how present they are to like be with the people and like work that Vinny was pretty good with that he tried to make you realize that there's a certain way this video studio should be of yeah. course you, you know people be sloppy and you know on disrespectful anyway but right. i remember in japan uh I when, I when i was living in japan occasionally i would go rehearse with the band in a studio or like with a one time i just rehearsed with a flute player in a studio and these studios were not comparable to brooklyn studios you know really? definitely smaller naturally but but just very neat, very like respectful towards the studio owner and uh, the neighbors, you know, you don't want to blast it so much that the building's going to fall down. Like you play at a respectable volume so you're not going to go deaf, mo at least the ones I've been to, you know. Uh, <laughs> so uh, Lou says, uh, clown food, ha ha ha. He defined Brooklyn Italian love. Yeah, Vinny. Um, <laughs> So, um, all right. So can you share your overall experience of being a drummer, the drummer in rock band, in a rock band or in rock bands, plural in the two thousands? Cause I guess that's when you were mainly active, right? But by, by the early two thousands. Yeah. All the way until like 2008, um, we were playing consistently, uh, especially with the band after that, mm -hmm. um, we were playing the tri-state area and then some um there were a lot of places to play back then uh and i i really feel like there was a big community now i don't know if that's because i'm older now and i'm just not out as out there as much but i mean even then there were people who were older than us that we were hanging out with who are all a part of that community it was very tight-knit and um and I just felt, feel like there was a lot more places to play, you know, especially mm -hmm. here, like in Brooklyn, you had, you had Lamore, then you had the other, that other place that opened up next to Lamore. Um, and you had all those, you know, you had CBGBs, you had uh, Don Hills, you, you had all these places that are just gone, that, you know, <laughs> aren't available that I know that. So I did play a place what was it called? The Pine Box? Something like Pine Pine Box? It was a nice place. They had a small venue in the back, but it wasn't, there was no traffic coming through. There, it wasn't, you know, a, a big place to play. There's no scene. I guess that's kind of the main thing, right? Yeah. And we played this other place that actually had a nice room. It was a decent sized room. It was in William, uh, not Williamsburg. It was in, what was it, Bed Stuy? One of these. Bushwick. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, there was a big bar on one side, like a really big bar, and a really big room next to it. Um, nice place, and actually, decent crowd. But again, you know, it's not the same. There was this. Everybody was just there for like one or two people, you know, they, and that was it. Well, you had you had a lot of people coming out to the moors, and um, I just feel like there was more of a scene. You know, yeah, there's a lot more yeah. going on. I, I could relate. I definitely, yeah, I, I, I'm not, I don't, I'm, I don't particularly lament it. It doesn't seem like, I don't think anything was better in those days, but it was certainly a different vibe that doesn't exist now. In my, that's my personal opinion. Uh, so, Lou has a question. If there was one thing you could take with you from the Brooklyn music scene from back then, what would it be? So, mm -hmm. I guess he means like, what, what would you, uh, Lou, if you want to clarify, what, what would he we bring into the present? Like, what do we wish existed now? Or just like, what are we going to like keep in our hearts going forward? I, I imagine he means what would you bring into the present? So if there's one thing from the Brooklyn music scene back then, what would it be that you could take with you? Um, well, if he's talking about like things I got out of it, it was just a lot of learning, you know, uh, playing with different, like different, different experiences and, and learning uh, really how to play with other musicians um, uh, because playing with playing with musicians in general like certain key players it's kind of, it's a relationship right so um, you get to learn how people react and and how they want something done or you know it, it's a big learning process i could take that away from it 
Um, what I wish was still around. Um, I don't know if I really wish anything was still around. I like that things change. Um, I like that music evolves and there's new musicians now. Um, when we played that show in 2019 before COVID, um, there was these bands, these young bands that were playing, especially this one girl solo guitar. She had acoustic guitar and she sang and she was fantastic. Her songs are beautiful. Um, so there is talent. It's not like there isn't. Um, there was this other group that played that night. They closed out the night and they were like a pop band. In fact, I got Lou on to them. I, I was like, Lou, check out this band. They're really good. Um, and um, it was so catchy and everyone could play their instruments. It's not like, you know, uh, the drummer was just, you know, playing. No, he was, he was on point. He was technically good, good groove. He was awesome. The whole, you know, mm -hmm. so I don't mind that things change. I don't want any, you know, I don't want anything to just stay the same all the time. That would be monotonous and boring, but, uh, but yeah. yeah. So to add to, so you great, great answer. Thank you. To add to Lou's question, you did clarify. Um, so, so yeah, that answered one part of his question and the other, I guess, sentiment, uh, sentiment was, um, sentiment, <laughs> sentiment was, uh, what, what tradition, if there was something, a tradition from back then that your days of your heydays of playing in bands, would you bring forward? Like that would be useful. Uh, Lou said, I would bring John Henry's basement, the culture of the, the culture of it. Forward. That's a good answer. Um, yeah, because you had a nice, you had a really good thing going on down in your basement. You had, um, you know, everyone would come in and play. And uh, it was just like, it, it was like a collective, you know, collective of ideas and styles. And, and it was, you had a really nice thing going down there. And, um, hmm. and it was, it was fun. Uh, what, from like my experience, what would I would want? Like, uh, I don't know. Um, I really enjoyed having the studio in Rockaway. That's one of the things I loved. Mm. I loved being able to go there at any time, which I would, and practice on my drums for hours on end, um, sometimes doing complete nonsense on the drums, um, and sometimes actually really digging in and, and, and practicing my ass off. But um, I, it, it felt like freedom, you know? Mm -hmm. just, just having your own musical space and, and just being able to do inviting people over other musicians and having jam sessions, kind of like what you had in your basement, but mm -hmm. you know, you know, I don't know. It was like 24 seven of just playing and we played a lot. A hell of right. a lot. With, with, uh, with the volume rules much different than my basement. Right. Yeah. And you could play loud into the middle of the night. Loud. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Actually that makes sense. Cause yeah, that, I guess that's, the culture I did try to engender in my basement is like, look, we're here to uh, hang out and have fun. But if you're not growing or doing something cool, mm -hmm. it's not, you know, it's not the point. Let's, let's, have, let's have fun together, you know, let's not just get wasted um, and, uh, and learn and, and explore. Uh, just like that's exactly what the Rockaway studio environment, that's what I loved about it too. When, when we had uh, studios in Rockway. It's like, I didn't make use of it like that, I guess, because I'm not quite a night owl. So if I was out with, with level six late, I wouldn't stay out any later. But um, uh, I did really appreciate that it was there. Mm -hmm. And you could use it. And it, basically, when you're there, you want to do musical things, you know, you don't really want to just, uh, I don't know, tune out and do something else. Um, right. So yeah, uh, and Lou said he would also shave his chest and hair, his chest hair into a palm tree because, you know. <laughs> uh, he yeah. should. No, yeah, he, I think he I think he should. should. I think he should. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, and then you, you could climb up the palm tree, pick the coconuts. Mm -hmm. yeah. Speaking of which, uh, I recently bought this Nintendo emulator thing, video game. It's basically like a Nintendo emulator that's plug and play. Okay. And uh, it was 45 bucks or something and has 600 
21 games on it wow. and just plug it into the you know yeah like a h whatever regular modern tv and um and the the control is like nintendo so it's really fun the the, the downside is there's no music but you know if you put on rock music and play it's really fun so i was playing adventure island today with my son and my brother so it was fun awesome. getting those yeah. fruits <clears throat> uh did you ever play adventure island no um i was always a big um we had this was it called demon sword demon sword. oh yeah demon I, was, sword. I was big into that um and i was also into i mean everyone's into mario but um what was the other game oh paper boy i could play paper boy <laughs> for hours oh yeah 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 you know i tried to play paper boy today and actually what happened was it it was like this what happened it didn't go to Paperboy. It went to this um, version of Super Mario One with like a frog character instead of Mario, <laughs> and it was really weird. So, so the, yeah, this system is you know it was forty five dollars, so you're gonna get some weird things. Listen, but yeah, <laughs> still, still, you get to play games regardless. Yeah, exactly, and a lot of a lot of good ones. You know, yeah. Super Mario One, Two, Three, yeah. uh, even has like what's called Super Mar Mario Super Mario. Six, eight, nine, really? which are these like alternate weird games that we never saw before. So uh, I just want to shout out to Josh Salant who uh, just chimed in and said, it was always fun jamming at your spot, John. Hey, hey, yo, Chris, I am still playing your 9,000 pedals. Thanks so much, man. <laughs> That's funny. I, I recently thought about that. Um, I remember selling him those pedals and he couldn't believe like I didn't like them. And I was just like, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. And I have, what do I have now? Oh, so af after that, or I think prior to selling him those pedals, I bought um, a set of Yamaha Flying Dragon double pedals. And they're the um, direct drive pedal. I still use them. I still have them. Um, and I use like an access linkage to connect the two pedals. And uh I'm, I'm actually looking into finally like buying a new set of pedals. And I was thinking about Josh because, you know, the not the DWs are, are again, they have like a new 9000 series or something. And I'm like, I wonder if he still has those. So that's, that's funny that he said that. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking it, it's just kind of coming to me, but uh, um, I'd like to do a conversation with us four, Lou, Josh, you and me one day hmm. soon, if, if you're up to that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So Josh and Lou, if you're listening, uh, let us know what that sounds like. And maybe I'll throw some dates out there. Just kind of a Brooklyn guys hang. So um, let's see. So without drudging up any unnecessary dramas, what were some of the biggest challenges you faced being in a rock band? Um, so well, one thing is creativity and writing, right? So everyone's got their own style and you always want to do your own thing as well as please um, the band, make sure that they're happy with what you're doing. You know, uh, that's one thing. The next thing is going into the studio and recording. Uh, I know like now mostly you get an electronic kit or you you play and you quantize or you use a keyboard and you you know you just or you're filling into a grid like most most drumming today is to listen to those songs on the radio but they're all mostly fake um it's all programmed or whatever and um you know but going to the studio and recording you had to you had to know the songs you know really well play to a click um, and, and just ha like, you had to have a good day, you know, on the kit. And that was always tough. Um, so r really those two things were really tough. Um, making sure you were, you know, doing your job on the kit, making sure everyone was pleased with what you were playing, um, and you, and your playing ability. Right. So you didn't want to, um, be too simplistic right you wanted to have a little bit of a flavor into your music right mm -hmm. I, I do believe that like um less is more 
but at the same time you don't want to be like just completely boring, <laughs> boring. yeah so All right you know those two things juggling that really was hard it could be hard interesting so so if i'm hearing you right you know excuse me i was replying uh, by the way josh and lou both said they'd love to hang and, and do it awesome. i'm going to just put it out there now how about next monday at the same time since we're all kind of available now yeah um yeah let's see what they say and if that's good for you maybe we'll put that in the calendar yeah. as the next one uh so so i'm, I'm that's surprising because to me that was definitely not the 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 challenge of being in a rock band for me so for you you felt like maybe not performance anxiety, but that you really want to do right by the band, but also right by yourself. You want to like, you know, do something you're proud of, but also, and that other people are happy with. Right. You didn't want to overcomplicate it. You didn't want to be overly simple. So you really felt this, maybe the stress, I don't know if the stress is the right word, but the stress of sort of getting it right. And then the constraints of, you know, you're paying for the time and all that stuff. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you have people in, you know, you have a rhythm guitar player, a lead guitar player, a bass player, right? Those three, you're always going to usually have those three in a rock band, right? And everyone's got their own different flavors, right? Everyone's got their own influences. And I mean, I, as drummer too, you have your own influences, but, you know, whoever's the songwriter, right? Um, they have an idea when they're writing a riff, they have an idea of where the drums are supposed to go, right? And, you know, you have your rhythm player and, and the bass player, you know, and you and the bass player are supposed to really lock in, right? So while you're trying to, you know, please the songwriter, you're also trying to lock in with the bass player and you kind of, you know, all right, so let me just juggle these few things and make sure that I'm getting the job done. And that's, that's always going through my head while I'm playing, like even now, like I'm, you know, I'm going to be 40 soon and um, I'm playing with these guys in the neighborhood that I found that um, they all have different uh, flavors of, of what they like. One guy is South African and has all these different rhythmic ideas that he drives me crazy with. Hmm. And um, he's a lovely guy, great bass player. Um, and, uh, you know, so... I'm always, I'm juggling the same thing now that I was 20 years ago. So, and uh, just trying to keep everyone happy. And, you know, it, it's funny. It's, it's, it's nothing really changes. You know? <laughs> yeah. Like this kind of repeating cycle right. until, until you learn what you're going to learn from that experience, or you just maybe love the experience. So you like to repeat it. Right. Um, <clears throat> hmm. Yeah, I'll just just kind of to make uh, just, just some contrast. Uh, so for me, um, some of my challenges uh, for being in a band was um, was more so finding people who were equally as dedicated as I was at that time, and then uh, who were willing to be as kind of serious about it. And then what would always bum me out was um, <clears throat> I would have a vision or even if as a group, we would have a vision and we'd want to move forward. And then there'd be one or two guys that would be like, I don't want to play that show. I, and I don't think we should do t-shirts, you know, or let's play only once a month or whatever. Or let's play every two months. Like, so there was never, I never found a group of guys and I'm not blaming it other guys. It has to do with my personality too. I'm not really cut out for being, uh, a, a rock, you know, performing musician. It, it, that's what I, I learned about myself. But at that time, I kind of wished I wasn't, I felt like held back by band members and different bands a lot. And that's why I kept on doing my solo thing all the time. Like, no, I've just, I went to music school, you know? So I'm like, I have all these uh, gifts I'm developing. I want to keep on just sharing it. And I had this more of approach of like, share freely. I didn't expect money. I didn't expect, uh, I don't want to convince anybody of anything. You know, I, I just want to play and share my music and not too many people have that, you know, that philosophy, yeah. you know, and, and fair enough. I mean, you know, lugging drums around, if you're not going to get paid my, you know, 
takes a rare person who's willing to do that. But, um, you know, that was one of my big frustrations. I could see that, uh, you know, I think everyone deals with, with band members who, you know, are just not as into it as you are. You know, I guess I didn't really, I never, I never cared enough to think that my band was going to be like the next Nirvana. Right. I was like, if, if the band does something, the band does something. I just wanted to have fun. Right. With, with the band. Like if you guys wanted to do t-shirts, let's make them fun. You know, let's, let's do something that's really interesting or, or, you know, I was always willing to play every weekend. In fact, with, with um, the band after that, Just One Chance, we, we played almost every weekend, sometimes two shows a weekend. It was a lot of fun. Um, Just One Chance. So that was the band after Mr. Jack Frost, which we didn't get a chance to talk about yet? Yeah, yeah. Tonight? Okay. We, we were playing everywhere, all kinds of festivals and shows. And um, that's the place we played in, in the skate park. Uh, it was in Johnston City. Right, right in Binghamton. That was that was a cool show. Um, mm. um, yeah, we, you know, and then you get you get guys who just you know they're they're filling space. So I know what you mean that could be frustrating, you know. That's yeah. Sad. So just one chance. What was the uh, what, what did you guys sound like? Because th that I definitely remember. <laughs> we sounded like we were like a hardcore metal band. So oh, yeah? like I don't know. We sound, I don't know what we sounded like, but yeah, we were like a hardcore metal band and um, we had a lot of fun. We had, a, we did a lot of our own albums um, in house. Um, it was just, it was a fun group, um, but then became, it became a job towards the end, which is, which is what it shouldn't be. It should always be fun. And you, you know, that reflects in your music too. When, when, a, when, Fighting to get guys to come to rehearsal, uh, you know, all the time, it, it reflects in the sounds of the band and the songwriting. And, you know, you know, when a band is on its way out, when, when the music just is, is, isn't there. So, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, let's see. Uh, so I'm sorry. I, I drifted. I I'm totally, totally heard you when the guys aren't into it and, yeah. No, I definitely. Uh, but I'm just want to let you know that Josh says I'm free before six on Mondays. Mm, okay, so that'll be an earlier show. I'm not sure if you guys are good with that. And where can we hear some music? Okay, Chris, is there any music you can point us to? I don't know where any of that music would be online now. It could be online if I put it on there. I might have to get the blessings of the other guys. Uh, yeah, it's that. always a good good move. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I don't know if any of that music is online now. Cool. Or cool. I could just if if anybody wants to send me an email, I could just link them to my uh, my Google Drive. Cool. All right. Yeah. So Josh, you could send Chris an email or a personal mess, a Facebook message, and he'll get you some killer tunes uh right right soon um and lou says mondays have been working for him recently and that uh next monday may work he'll let us know on uh thursday by thursday i think um i'm thinking chris i don't know if you're game i don't want to uh we could still totally keep the interview going but if you're up for pulling Lou on unless you got to get off soon or something or you just no if he wants to join yeah uh he didn't ask to or say anything oh. but i'm thinking uh he's hanging with us anyway so sure um lou lou are you there are you there lou <laughs> um if you want to come on as co-host lou calling lou the co-host are you there i feel like star trek or something Scotty. Uh, but so we'll, we'll see what he says um uh anyway and josh too hey if you're if you want to come on and do a double co-host uh for a little while oh there goes the neighborhood yeah josh go ahead come on I'll, I'll send you guys a link um this way you guys can keep talking while i go pee uh yeah small bladder man oh, it must be the coffee <laughs> it is <laughs> yeah it's gotta be i know you're inspiring me to to think of the possibilities of a coffee-free life. 
tea. It's it's so like when I'm when I'm not feeling well, I have I bought like a pound and a half of this um, tea vana tea, which is it's getting kind of old now, but it's um it's a monkey monkey picked oolong tea, and it's delicious. It's very earthy, but when I when I um, not feeling well, I'll I'll have a cup of two, and it makes me feel a lot better. It really does. I know like you know like all oh, herbal remedies really don't work, but I don't know. This does. Hmm. It really does. I love tea. Cool, man. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm uh, embracing tea a lot. I'm drinking probably equal amounts of tea and uh, um, coffee, maybe more tea in this these days, which I'm mm. kind of proud of because that, that never really <clears throat> came natural to me. All right, so I'm going to go to uh, the link that I sent you and I'm going to forward it to our, our buddies because they said they can join right now on. all right yeah make it happen now this is kind of fun are you good for a little while longer yeah um, yeah, yeah okay cool josh and lou all right cool <clears throat> yeah when you're talking about drums in brooklyn and life then then yeah. you just attract uh you attract kindred souls Everyone comes out of the woodwork. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so it goes. Cool. So, uh, so um, Josh and Lou, if you are listening, I just emailed you the link. Let me know if that works. You should just be able to click it, and then I will look for you and let you in. So, um, so next question is. Uh, would it be fair? I think you kind of hinted at the answer already, but would it be fair to say that you were chasing the rock star dream for some part of your life? I think the early part, like up until probably up until like 2003, like when I was young, I was, you know, like all oh, being a rock star would be awesome. And then I, at that point, I didn't care. Like after that, I didn't care. If it happened, it happened. If it didn't, whatever. I just wanted to have fun. Like to me, like I wanted to be the best musician I could be, but I would have rather have been a studio musician than a rock mm. star. Um, mm. So more about the music in a way, just, right? I, yeah, I like I like being in the studio. I like writing with other people. I like it, that that intimate setting. You know, getting on stage is fun and it's it's a gas, but it's unnecessary. <laughs> so yeah the, all the egos come out more yeah, hey there he is. Hey. hey hey with his alice and chain shirt Love on too no less how you doing chris what's Great. going on brother how you doing dude oh I'm, I'm 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 having so much fun listening to you guys talk I, cool. i've been watching you play on on uh you've been putting posting your videos to instagram and stuff yeah on, on facebook yeah. dude awesome yeah. awesome stuff Thanks, man. I'm just, I'm, I, you know, listen, this is what we do. We like to have fun with it, right? Yes. Why if not? You're having fun. What are you, why are you doing it? Right? Right. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> How you doing, John? Good, um, man. Good. This, this you might like. I've been working on, uh, can you see this? Is it too much? Steve Gadlix. Oh, so, nice. Yeah. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Wow. Yeah. Um, uh yeah i was watching some videos of uh steve gad the other day you know he's just like you know he just comes from like a military uh drumming you know the, the military school of drumming and he right. like he made he made a whole pop career to become one of the biggest session drummers of all time <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah i mean he's got this natural groove that is gritty yet as smooth as could be you know it's it's a beautiful thing like beautiful one of the songs in there it's 50 50 ways to leave your lover right well there's nothing drumming. like there's nothing like being creative being an individual but also being a team player right hmm. that's like the trifecta right of rock right right who, who fits into that category guys the being creative being individual and also being a team player like can you think of three guys that that kind of sum that up pretty well uh maybe mm. billy sheehan Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, I could see that. Uh, guitar player. Uh, Three guys that that kind of sum that uh, up. Jeff Beck. 
a great Ooh. guitar player, right? And just, oh, just an all around like. Uh, I could see that. Yeah. Let's see. I always see is the head with the glasses. Guys, Those that, glasses. Kind of sum that up. Jeff Beck. There he there is. There he is. Right? What's going on, guys? Just an all around like. Hey, hey. Yeah. All right. The uh, the boys are in the house. <laughs> oh, he looks there beautiful he too. What's going on, guys? <laughs> nice. Poppy. Hey, hey. Yeah. All right. The uh, the boys are in the house. Hey, we're having fun. Oh, he looks there beautiful too. What's going on? Guys? <laughs> nice. Oh, I'm hearing. Oh, I think I'm hearing uh, Facebook right. behind you. Yeah, yeah. Something. Oh, maybe there is that. Could that be? Oh, that's right. Hey, we're having fun. Oh, yes, I, I was hearing. Yeah, some looping going on. Yeah. Nice. Oh, I'm hearing. Oh, okay. I'm hearing uh, Facebook right. behind you. I'm headed. Yeah, yeah. Something. Oh, maybe there is that. Could that be? Oh, that's right. Hey, we're having fun. <laughs> yes, this is like a sonic adventure we're having right now. I feel like we're like uh, Pink Floyd in the studio, uh, <laughs> creating some weird trippy. Uh, <laughs> oh, we're all over the bro. We are home now. How are you guys doing? <laughs> What's going on? Pretty Time good. To speak. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like three hours. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you guys can go three hours without speaking. I thought it was only like an hour. <laughs> Usually, he's been yeah. ignoring my text, so I had to show up here to to see what he was up to. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> don't hate, don't hate. So, um, so I want to throw that question out with Lou here too. So, so Josh said, um, talking about. Who was it, Steve? Chris, Chris. Some, uh, the, that to these three points to have to be a creative, be individualistic, yet a team player, like to be truly all those three, not individualistic, but to be a true individual and a team player, creative, individual, and team player. Which I don't know, musicians can we think of that fall into that category? Uh, was it Chris said Billy Sheehan? So yeah, Lou, can you throw anyone out and throw anyone into that category? Are we talking about like famous musicians or people we know? I'd say anyone's fair game right now. Uh, if 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 someone in the uh, listening audience hears a name they don't recognize, they could e email me and I'll I'll give them a a lengthy description of that person, if need be. That's a so they have to be a mix of all three. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, I don't really want to give examples of who wouldn't be that, but I'm sure we can think of many. <laughs> oh, I have one <laughs> have list, pretty much. Oh, what about Dimebag Daryl? Hmm. Well, yeah. certainly creative, certainly individual, and certainly, yeah, certainly a team player, right? He was right. pretty much only like two bands or something. I mean, more or less. Uh, yeah, and you know, people will, like yeah. in the metal community, they they loved him. He was he oh. was a he was a you know he was a big part of it. He was. He was everybody's friend, you know. Right. Mm -hmm. Chris Cornell, right? Everyone Chris Cornell. Everyone with him, and talk about creative and and team player. And you know. I oh, guess man. in that context, I'd say Dave Matthews. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, because yeah, he, he holds it all together. He's such a unique guy, super creative, but he's very, you know, uh, loyal to his band. Although he does his own stuff too. Yeah, and everybody's got song like songwriting credits. Everybody has their solo parts. Like it, it seems as though he's just kind of the ringleader, <clears throat> and then uh, everybody's themselves within. So I would say Dave Matthews. Yeah, good answer. So, so I'll, I'll, I, I agree with that. I'll throw one out. I which just kind of came to me partly because Lou is here and the the, the three of you guys, uh, Mike Patton. Would he fit into that? Ah. Uh. That's oh, Lou's man. boy. No, most likely not. Right. So which which so obviously creative, obviously individual. So it's team player that doesn't work with him. I would think so. I it mean, with like Faith No can't... More, it seemed like it, but uh, I don't know, Mr. Bungle, if he was a team player in that, I don't know. It seems like he needs a new band every year, and now okay. he's like maxed out at like ten, so he's just doing like one album per per decade. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, I wouldn't say team player, and I've heard a lot of stories like he's he's one of those. Those celebrities that like you wouldn't want to meet him. Mm. Oh, really? Oh, I, I mean, I could be wrong. I, I wouldn't want to say something like that, you know, live on the internet. Like this guy's a terrible person or whatever. That's your boy, they, though, right? They say that he's ruined fans' uh, experiences of him by meeting really? him. Really? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, 
I remember he was a big influence on you at some point, right? For a period of time. Oh yeah. The songwriting, the sound, I mean, everything he, he's probably still, he's probably my number two on my list. Yeah. With Chris Cornell being number one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because uh, Chris just heard the version of patience he did. He was genuine. Uh, it seemed at the moments that he wrote what he did. Um, you can definitely feel like it definitely felt like that's how he was feeling when he was singing it. Um, yeah. I mean, he really, he, he dug it to like the deepest you can get of like human emotion. I felt like with the, with the lyrics still sometimes being a little ambiguous, but uh, Chris I, or Mike talking about Chris. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. No, Mike Patton's a complete like sports showman. He's not a, mm -hmm. he makes sounds for sport. Right. Like not, not the depth. Right. Do. Mm -hmm. um uh, yeah i would have to say that mm -hmm. yeah right I, I um just to stick on mike Patton for a second so part of my process of writing my book i've been going year by year looking at the music that comes out every year and trying to like you help use that as a guide as i write each each year of my life like which music was there and so i got to 92 and uh Angel Dust pops up as I'm going through all the albums of that year. And uh, so I listen to Midlife Crisis. I'm like, I forgot about that song. And I put it on I'm like, wow. It, I, again, it's not particularly deep. It seems like it's deep, like it could be. I don't think it is, but um, it's really fascinating, you know, to come up with that song. Oh yeah. Well, every note they chose, like at every point in time, the melodies, I mean, everything was just so... I don't want to use the term bizarre because I mean, actually years after it, it seems to make sense, but um, yeah, they had some choice of, of writing and just everything. They, they're definitely, that was my second most inspirational, if not most inspirational that um, I was able to obtain musically. Mm. So, so regarding that, that list of guys who fit those three criteria or girls, um, creative individual and team player. Uh, how about, how about James Hetfield? You would have to say yes, I guess. Yeah. I mean, he's been with that, that band solely, right? He, he really, has he had any side projects? I don't think so. I think that was like his hard. Right. So, I mean, he's, no. he's been, and that's his band. He does all the writing. He does, you know, He's definitely a great songwriter. Mm -hmm. He's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that, that's a little borderline in my, as I rethink it, because uh, creative, certainly, individual, kind of, right? Um, team player, also, yes, for sure, but it's also a little bit my way of the highway team player, I think, from what I yeah. learned about Metallica. So it's kind of like, you know, somewhere in that in that realm but not quite the uh, like the shining example of that maybe it, it depends opinion. to be honest it depends on how you look at it because most bands don't even make it a quarter as long as they did so yeah. if you think in the context of like and uh, i don't know laws all personally or anything like that but if you can last that many years with that rigorous of a touring schedule with some of those guys in that band you, you're you're a team player <laughs> like right. it, it may not be the happiest and it might not be shiny and bright, but I, I mean, what they achieved, even just by staying together that long and, and the level of like hard work. I mean, I get not being in another band if, if the band is pushing that hard, because you have no time to do another one. It's like, if you do another one, you're just taking away from it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess, I mean, he de devoted his whole life to it, right? So that, mm -hmm. that means team player. So Chris, I want to jump back to Chris here. So, so Josh and Lou, can I assign you guys as my co-hosts? And uh, let's fo focus on our guest, Chris the Star. Mm -hmm. Of course, Thank yeah. You. you guys are awesome. So Chris the Star, um, I want to ask you, can you think of one to two songs that you wrote that, I'm sorry, uh, that you were involved in writing if you write it wrote directly in, um, that really reflects a certain moment or time in your life that you feel proud to have written? And don't feel like the need to flatter Lou if, if he was involved with anything. <laughs> so, 
in JOC. Oh God, do I even remember the name of the song? I remember how the song goes. I don't think I remember the name of the song. Um, I had a, I had a, a lot of influence on. I wrote the lyrics, um, and me and the bass player really wrote a lot of the melody, and it became one of our biggest songs. And the whole like all my lyrics and everything about the word to be true to yourself, right? And just really just you be you. Um, and we played in a very to a very Hispanic crowd. And I guess they didn't really get the lyrics because I got questioned on them. And I said, well, you know, and I, and I pointed certain things out and I said, well, this is, this is what this means. And when they thought about it, they were like, oh yeah. And I was like, right. I said, I'm just really telling everybody like, you know, support your own thing, do your own thing. You, you should always be you and not somebody else. And, and then when that became like one of our biggest songs and, I wrote the song. I named the song. I don't know what it's called. So, um, in my defense, that was 15 years ago, 16 years ago. So, uh, that's great. Um, but so you remember that period of life of your life, and you can associate it with that song, right? So, you know, during that time, I, I had um, started. Um, I was already with the company I'm with now. I've been with the company for 19 years, um, but I was taking on a new job. Um, and there was, there was a lot of going on. Like I really had to be myself, um, and like do more. Um, and another song oof, that I was really proud of a lot. Um, cause I, I really, I really became a fan of all the bands I was in. So, um, so okay also joc um you know we were in a metal band and there was this one song it was like a real fast riff and it was i was just like another one like i was like so you guys want me to play like you know you know so when we were writing the song i was playing that like fast double bass and you know fast hands and then the next time we played the song, I was just disgusted. I started playing. So I did it for like four measures. And then I broke into a straight up dance beat, you know. And, and like, well, it might have been even more dancier than that. They, they loved it. They were like, that is so awesome. And I was like, good, because that's staying. I'm yes like, i'm tired of i'm tired of this like <laughs> like stagnated drumming you know we need to do something more than that so um and in fact when we played the first show we played i think it was the red zone we played the first time uh, in queens right yes oh, so, yeah uh, <laughs> we break into the song right and it starts out fast and I, like i said we played to like a bunch of it was a big spanish crowd and as um, soon as the dance beat broke out, the whole place erupted. They loved oh, it. Wow. And I was just like, oh, thank God. You know, that <laughs> and because no one had heard the song before. We didn't have it on an album. We didn't, it was just like the first time we played it. And it was, it was awesome. Cool. That, that was, that's two great stories. Thanks. Uh, I just want to shout out to Tom Scuderi, who's watching. Hey, Tom. Hey. Tom says, hi, Josh, John, and Lou. Hey, and, Tom. Uh, Chris and he doesn't know uh, me from bowling. Come on, Tom. Tom, <laughs> what about Chris? This this is our Chris interview. And the Mama, uh, the Mama Luke's. <laughs> the Mama Luke's. Don't you know them? Is that the name of the team, Chris? That's the name of the team, yeah. <laughs> the and uh, and Tom says, Hey Josh, cool Alice and Chain shirt. Well, thank you. I have a funny story about Chris about Chris. Sure, please. Oh, yeah. Well, 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 not not really funny, but I remember. Uh, when he came to the shop one time and he was playing doubles on the practice pad and I was, I was watching his hands and I was like, wow, man, I haven't seen anybody play doubles like that. It was just so clean and beautiful. And I really wasn't good at doubles. And I was just watching his hands fly and I was very proud. And I was like, dude, you rock. <laughs> Josh, you've always been good at doubles. I don't know. You, I used to watch you, know, you play like your hands are just like you're very fluid, very fluid. Well, when I first met you, you know, I, I, I was I was just kind of getting my feet wet into drumming, you know. So I was just kind of learning the ropes and I was learning from a lot of people, yourself included. 
because because you showed me what to do and i said oh dude that makes sense but i'll never forget that i remember it was like it was like an evening you know so like everybody you know was coming home from work and you just happened to be in the shop and you were just playing on that pad and it was just beautiful oh, and nice, i just man. always nice. think about that every time Every time I practice doubles, I'm like, I got to get those Bonica doubles, man. <laughs> those were gorgeous. <laughs> well, yeah, my teacher was very uh, thorough on my doubles and triples. And, nice. and uh, Oh, did you study with Normie Wayne? No, uh, Rob Rocco Oh. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. If, 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 you met, if you messed something up, it was girly boy. What, do you, what is that girly boy? Well, <laughs> you know, and that was, that was constant, you know. Yeah. Rob's uh, a serious drummer. Oh, he's the best. This, <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's the best. This, did you? He put out a video recently. It might have been today or yesterday on Facebook, and he's doing fives. Wait, five, five way independence. He, it, yeah, it is five way independence. <laughs> but he's doing fives with one hand. I think it, everything. I might be doing this wrong. <laughs> he's either doing fives with his left or his right, and and I think sevens or threes on the other hand. And the hi hat is just doing straight like four four. And I mean, the whole thing's in 4-4, but like, he's, he's just, the guy is incredible. You know, he's mm. absolutely incredible. How Sorry, do you guys I'm count like that? What do you mean? I, I could barely count 4-4. It's like riding a bike. You don't count. You just feel. <laughs> and Chris, especially like when, when we know? used to write together, you always went for some type of like odd timing without a, within a timing. Like you I, naturally just go toward these odd rhythms. When well, when we were playing together, I was listening to a hell of a lot of Dream Theater and Rush. Oh. So you know, mm. oh, and Death. Can't forget about Death. I was listening to a lot of Death. Gene Hoglin. Yes, I mean Gene Hoglin is just you know God's gift. The best to double bass. Wow. So, um, and, and so when we were playing together, I I was just experimenting with as much as I could. You know, and I didn't want to be like, I never wanted to be that guy who was just known for one thing. Right. I, so I would experiment with everything and, and having Rob as a teacher, Rob would be like, well, okay, today you're going to learn what a bossa nova is. And I was like, okay, well, how can I incorporate that into just one chance or, or Jack Frost or sort of a band that was in at the time, you know, and, and it was, it was cool. You know, I would, I would be like, all right, cool. Dance beats, you know, or whatever it was. You know? <laughs> I would have pinned you for more of like a, a tool fan, to be honest. I love tool. I think, but they, I mean, like more influenced the best by thing they've ever released. What? Oh, it's what Fear Inoculum? I, oh, it's incredible. It's yeah. incredible. I had to change my What's that song, Numa? I, I love the album. It's incredible. And then what is he playing on? Like, there's a there's a song that starts out and it's like. I feel like he's playing on like tubes or something. I don't know. Yeah. Um, if you watch the live video, um, there's a live video, like uh, like a drum cam video. And he's playing on like an electronic pad that's kind of like, uh, I guess it's supposed to be like uh, like a sitar or something sound. But he's playing on that first. Is that what that's what he's doing? The, well, that's, that's what he's doing on, in the show. I don't know if that's what he's doing in the studio. It's probably what he's doing in the studio. Because... How many times did you need to change your pants again? Oh, at least twice. <laughs> at least twice. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that was a great album. You know, I I'm I'm gonna I might be the dog man out here, but um, I never was a Tool fan. I could appreciate it if someone like sat me down and kind of forced me to listen to it. I'd listen to it and probably enjoy all the things that they were pointing out. But uh, <laughs> I I did prefer Perfect Circle. Not that I'm a big uh, fan, but I did Perfect I did like Circle. them a little more. Judith, a few of their songs are really yeah, awesome. Judith, that that whole album is incredible. Anything yeah. Josh Freese plays Josh on is Freese, amazing. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So is Josh Freese. Do you Freese follow him drummer? on Instagram? Yeah, he's a session drummer, but I think he was in the band for a while, right? The last two, well, the last two albums from like 15 years ago. <laughs> the, newest, the newest album, I don't know who plays on that, and that was not that good. Was it Eat the Elephant? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know that album. I didn't like it. Uh, they have one good song. Yeah. Mary Noms, you know. right? Yeah, yeah. Mary Noms is the one that I know and, and love. Uh, so and, and Tom Scuderi, just just quick shout out to him. He says that. So now, just to fair fair mention, Tom hasn't heard Chris Bonica's drum playing yet, which he, we need to change that. That's why we got to get some of your demos up there. But uh, so he, uh, Tom Scuderi says the top four drummers that I saw live 
top four are Dave Grohl, Taylor Hawkins, Josh Salant, and Robbie Benson. All right. So. <laughs> Josh, you're a great drummer. I tell you, I tell everybody. Hey, about Tommy, you, you, you have, a lot. You have no idea. <laughs> Robbie Benson was pretty good. <laughs> I, I never heard Robbie Benson. Oh, no. No. He, he's, a, he's a pencil people drummer. So my Cornucopia album has mainly him and uh, Dave Evans plays on one or two tracks. Oh, Dave Evans. You know, you know, Dave Evans kit is, is my kit. I bought my kit from Dave Evans. Oh. Right. Yeah. I know. When I sat behind it in your studio, I'm like, this is yeah. Familiar. Looks familiar, right? Yeah. And I, I always love the sound of it. It's got this kind of <clears throat> funk rock sound, you know, Dave Evans is a good guy, man. Yeah. Great drummer. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. I remember I was like, I was like, man, you don't need any of this stuff. And he's like, no, I got my little Gretsch, you know, he's like, I'm good. I don't want this monstrosity. Get out of my house. <laughs> cool. Um, Dave Evans, yeah. So, uh, so let me, uh, Lou or Josh, could you have a question for Chris? And you could um, take over as co-host while I go use the uh, the boys' room, little boys' yeah. room. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Lou, you want to go first? Or? Yeah, I'll go first. Okay, I'll be right back. So, so if there is an artist other than Chris Cornell that you Keep it clean. have the option to um, shave chest hair with, who would it be? Uh, How to break the rules. <laughs> we're just going to go Dave Grohl. Wow. So you would shave chest hair with Dave Absolutely. Grohl. Absolutely. Dave Grohl. Between his drumming in Nirvana and everything after with the Foo Fighters. I, in fact, I almost wore a Foo Fighters shirt tonight, but um, yeah, Dave would Grohl. Would Absolutely. you shave his chest hair while he was playing, or would you make him pause between songs? Both. Okay. Between songs and while he's playing. So, so to the serious question, if there was an artist, because I know me and you both put Cornell number one, besides <laughs> Cornell, who would it be? Like frontman or drummer or... Yeah, just somebody to either jam with or be in the group like a famous... Okay. Who's number two on your list? So... One of the things that kept me playing early on was I wanted to be able, like, I wanted to get to a level of playing where I could sit in with Dimebag. That was, Ooh. that was like a goal where I was like, I would be good enough to sit and jam with Dimebag. Yeah. So he would be like my number two. Okay. I could see that. Yeah. Uh, you know. uh, I got a question for you, Chris. What's up? It's, just, it's a tricky one, but. Um, top three drummers that influence your playing style mo three. most closely. Okay, that influence me, not my favorite drummers. Because that's like the drummers, like when you sit down at the kit and you go like, and like you know, like when you first pick up your sticks and the first thing you play, it's kind of like, oh yeah, that kind of feels like something Charlie Watts would do or something yeah. Steve Gadd would do. Like, what is, what is so, the? Um, I wish. I wish I could play like Steve Gadd, but that's that's way beyond my comprehension. So, um, I mean, I would Dave Grohl would be one of them. Right? Yeah, definitely. Uh, and thinking about like when I started playing, Matt Cameron would be another. Mm -hmm. And then probably the third would be uh, 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 Vinnie Paul. Oh, so, right, because the, the whole correlation to dime bag right so um many put those three you know and then like a close third would probably be raymond herrera so where's raymond herrera from fear factory ah because i was just listening to a fear factory song on uh on sou do you get you ever listen to sou oh, yeah. 89.5 oh my god <laughs> yeah so so it doesn't come in that great you know in in <laughs> brooklyn but if you use the iheart radio app you Bluetooth it, it's like crystal clear. And they play like tons of Gojira. They play tons of, tons of all like really great metal bands. Right. Yeah. So it's like a walk through, you know, it's, it's, nostal it's nostalgia. I haven't heard of that station in so long. <laughs> oh, I, I oh I, yeah. Like the DJs are really cute too. You know, they're like, you know, cause they're really young, you know? So they're like, they're like, Oh, the first time I saw these guys was when my sister took me, you know, they're like, they're like punks, you know? Yeah. I love last, it. It was like last year. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> right. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, when I turned 18, you know, when I turned 19. But uh yeah, well, those are three monster drummers, and those are three like, you know, I guess like you know, of uh, some of the most influential drummers of the 90s slash early 2000s. Right. I mean, you had a lot of great drummers in the 90s, a ton, you know. Uh, who was the guy who played on the first um, White Zombie album? Uh, La Six or Sisto. Oh, that guy's What's great. His name? I, I forget um, that's his name. One that has, well, that's the one that has uh, 66 on there. Um, Thunder Kiss 65. Oh, 65, uh, right, right, I mean. Right. Yeah. Uh, um, I don't know who that guy is. He's incredible, though. Incredible. The whole, I mean, the whole album, he's a, a groove heavy machine. And it's it just, that's another album I wore the tape out. Like, oh, you know, fantastic totally. album. Yeah. Is that totally. What about uh, Dave Abrazizi from Pearl Jam? Oh, John Tempesta. The groom. No, no. Tempesta came after. Okay. So there you go. There's the name. I Dave Abrazizi from Pearl Jam was really good. He was awesome. Oh, yeah. yeah, it was great. 90s drummers. Who, the uh, first drummer was was the best. Who was John Cruz? John, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So that, that was the one that I liked the most, yeah. The one who kind of looked like Eddie Vedder at that time, right? Yeah. They kind of like competing. Like he was almost as sexy and cool as Eddie Vedder, right? So I think Eddie Vedder didn't like that. <laughs> yeah. No, that was David Abrazese, I think. You're, oh, you're was it? About. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. He's so great. I heard that he had timing issues uh, in, in the studio, and that's why Eddie Vedder and him clashed. Hmm. I don't know how true that is. But speaking of Pearl Jam, uh, Matt, uh, sorry, um, Tom Scuderi says uh, Matt Cameron is a really good drummer, Soundgarden and Pearl Jam. Oh. The best. To be in two of the biggest 90s grunge bands. Mm -hmm. Right? Better in <laughs> yeah. Soundgarden. What Much a career! Soundgarden. Yeah, I mean, that, oh, right. yeah. Soundgarden fit him better. I yeah. Know. Yeah. I don't know what happened when he got to Pearl Jam and he bumped everything up by like 140 BPM. <laughs> and I, every Pearl Jam song now sounds like a Megadeth live song. Like they're in a rush to go home. Oh, you know who played? Uh, you know who played on a Megadeth album? Uh, it was it was the System Has Failed. It oh, was um, yeah. it was Vinnie Caliuta. Yep, he recorded that right. album. Yeah, so Vinnie Caliuta is like this big session drummer. He played. He most famously played with like Frank Zappa. Um, you know, is so, so is that famous story with him and Terry Bozio? Uh, which uh, which one is that? I don't know that one. So Steve Vai. So in one of, I used to read Drum Magazine and, and Modern Drummer. So Steve Vai, they did an article they were talking about Vinnie Caliuta. And um, at the time, Terry Bozio was like, he was the king on drums, right? The Black Page was written for him. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, he even, he was like as big as Frank Zappa was. So um, he wound up leaving Frank Zappa and I think he took some of Frank Zappa's band. So um, Frank Zappa finds this kid, right? And I, there's an interview with Vinny Caliuta on his uh, um, audition for Frank Zappa, which was so Yes, awesome. I saw that video. Did you? Awesome. So um, he winds up in inviting Terry Bozio to do some lyrics, to do some vocals. And you have, so you have Frank Zappa, Terry Bozio, uh, Vinny Caliuta, and uh, uh, Steve Vai in the room. I don't know who else was. Oh, room, man, what a band. Right? So, and Frank Zappa was doing this just to be a jerk. So he what shows Terry Bozio the sheet music. And Terry that got lose attention <laughs> when you said that. Of course, that's his favorite part. I saw that. <laughs> I've heard so many stories of Zappa. I mean, it's just right. so, you hear about them all the time. So he shows Bozio the sheet music, and Bozio's like, he's looking at it. He goes, "This is harder than the Black Page," and he goes, "Yeah." And he goes, "This is the first time this kid's ever going to see it." He puts it on the sheet, you know, the stand in front of in front of uh, Vinnie Caliuta, and so. Um, Vinnie Caliuta wearing glasses and he's eating sushi while oh. sight reading this this page <laughs> and he's playing it perfectly while flipping sushi into his mouth and fixing his glasses and Terry Bozio was like F this threw the sheet music away and, and left the studio that's that, that was kind of the story so that's how good 
Vinny is. Vinny is oh, man. like uh. the, when you think of like top drummers, the one above all, that's that's Vinny Caliuta. Yeah. Yeah. And like to think about somebody who could play in in so many versatile styles, you know. Anything. Um Anything. there's another interview about the audition for uh, Vinny Caliuta's audition for Zappa. So so he gets there. <clears throat> And it's like this big warehouse and there's like a line like around the corner uh, to get in. It was just an open call for all musicians. It wasn't just drummers. It was drummers, guitar players, bass players. So everybody's there trying to be in Zappa's band. And and like uh, Vinny, and he's throwing all these crazy things out to Vinny Kaliuta and uh, he's doing it. So he goes, OK, great. Uh, you wait here. He goes, he goes, I doubt I'm going to find any other drummer that's better than you but I still have to give these people a chance. So you just wait over here. And he got the gig and the rest is history. You know, he was, he was basically, you know, uh, just a kid. He didn't even, uh, he didn't even drive there. He had like, a, you know, somebody, somebody, somebody had to give him a ride. Cause he yeah. just, wow. you know, he wasn't established in, in, in Los he was Angeles. Like, he was like 17. <laughs> yeah. He was wow. like this young kid. He was sleeping on people's couches. Yeah. That's the dream, right? That's the yeah. dream. Somebody picks you up. But the reality is, is that you got to do all the work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you got to keep it going once you get your foot in the door. And, you know, then the Zappa band's done. Then you have to somehow keep the career going with your own work ethic or your charisma. Who knows what it is that gets you into the next door, you know? Look yeah. at guys like Dave Grohl. I mean, you know, was a drummer, you know, and uh, did some backup vocals on, in, you know, in Nirvana. And then he just had his own band. That was incredible. Is incredible. It's probably probably the biggest rock and roll band out right now. And then you got metal bands. You have like uh, like Gojira. They're probably the biggest metal band out right now. But I mean, in terms of rock and roll, you know, it's definitely uh, definitely uh, Dave Grohl and the guys. Yeah, and, yeah. And, you know, he just has a knack of of like writing these catchy tunes. You know, they're simple, but when you put it all together, it's it's. It's fantastic. His his just his ability to, to piece those songs together, you know. And he comes out of the gig and he comes out yes. screaming in the first song. He's screaming at like full volume, <laughs> <Yeah>. full strain. <laughs> and you're like, how's this guy gonna do this for the next three hours? He and does. he does. <laughs> I did it with I a don't broken get foot. It. Yeah. I, 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 was, I, I went to that tour. That was awesome. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't get it. I I'm actually um I met Tommy there. I didn't know right, Tommy right. was going. And I was like, and I was like, yo, you know, I was like, yo, what's up, Tom? So we hung out, you know, with, uh, with Tom and Tim, you know? Yeah, Tom, Tom cool. tells me that memory. He loved that. And Tom says the in this chat here, in our conversation, he says, congrats to the Foo Fighters for making the 2021 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Wow. Now that's, that's an accomplishment because a lot of bands don't. Right, right. <laughs> what was it? 2019, you had Soundgarden and, and Pat Benatar, right? Was it Pat Benatar? Yeah, Did you yeah. Make it, the two of them? It's, it's kind of sad. So we'll still, you know, we'll, we'll get them in. So we'll get Chris Cornell in. I think, oh, Ju- yeah. I think Judas Priest isn't even in it yet. Is that no? true? Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think they were on the same bill. Right. Oh, yeah. Painkiller well, Dave- album. <laughs> I know. Well, Dave Grohl's a little bit of the everything. Faith album. Is that Luke? I right? love those albums. Dave Grohl's a little bit of everything. He's a guitar player. He's a writer. He's a singer. He's a drummer. He's an engineer. Yeah, he's engineered almost all of his albums on analog stuff. Yeah, so he's he's like underwater in just audio in general, with everything. Yeah, he's yeah, and, and he's, he's cool. pretty cool guy too, right? That's what I hear. Yeah, he seems fairly real to me. I don't know. Oh, he had a cameo in the uh, the new Bill and Ted movie. Did you guys see Did it? Did he? No, I didn't see it. No. Oh yeah, yeah. I uh, yeah, like just just for a second, but. Just to see him, you know, represent rock in Bill and Ted, you're like, ah, of course, of course, oh, he's Dave Grohl, you know, or like, or the stuff he did with uh, with Tenacious D and Pick of Destiny. You ever see that one? No. Oh, Pick of Destiny is an amazing movie with you know with Jack Black and uh, Kyle Glass, Kyle Gass rather, um, and um, it's about these two guys who just you know form a band and try to make it, you know. Mm-hmm. But uh, if you haven't seen that movie, oh man, it's hilarious. Yeah. And Dave Grohl's in it, of course, you know. Mm-hmm. But right. uh, I know that he directed, so he directed a few of the Foo Fighters videos, and he also directed um, uh, Crooked Steps, the Soundgarden song, the yep. last album. 
he did that video as well. Uh, some of the videos he did for the for the for, the, for the Foo Fighters though were hysterical. Hmm. There's, there's one of like a truck stop. Did you guys see that one? No. No. no? Oh, okay. Google search. I forget what song it is. Google search that video. Uh, uh, truck stop Foo Fighters song. If you okay. On YouTube. It's, he said he got the idea why they were at a truck stop and he thought like what was going on was like the weirdest thing. And when you watch the video, it's very uncomfortable. <laughs> like, what was that one he did that was like falling down? Uh, Remember? I don't know. Learn it to walk like... again. That song? Oh, maybe I didn't see the video. Oh, yeah. Well... Another confession to make? Oh, <laughs> uh, no, no. It wasn't that one. It was. Best um... you. you just started yeah. singing it. Yeah. The best, the best of No, 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 no. Learning to walk again. Um Learn how to fly? No, I, no, actually I think it's I think it's called I'm not sure. But the thing is it was funny because because when I saw the video, I said, Wow, this is just like falling down. And I remember the one time I saw falling down was at Lou's house. He was watching falling down. <laughs> It's one of my favorite movies ever. Yeah, I feel like that guy. <laughs> I know it's a Lou movie. It is a Lou movie. So here's a question, guys. So Dave Grohl can sing, Dave Grohl can scream, but can Dave Grohl growl? Can can Grohl growl? <laughs> can Dave Grohl growl? <laughs> I had to just yes. <laughs> can, he, can Grohl growl, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> Sure. You got to give a guy like that credit because he's mm -hmm. writing too, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He can write. I can't write. I have to rely on songwriters, you know? I just play drums. But a guy that can sit and write, and, you know, uh, has the, um, you know, just uh, just has the courage to be like, hey, I wrote this, you know? I hope you guys like this. It's like, it's, it's hard, man. I mean, I know you guys do it. But, um, you know, it's hard. I mean, that's. That's very big shoes to fill from playing drums in a grunge band, you know? Mm -hmm. I guess, that, yeah, true. But I also guess there's another aspect too, which is like he had to realize he's going to have to hand over his king of drums crown too, right? And he had to, to find a drummer with equally as big teeth. No. Oh. <laughs> Taylor Hawkins. That's hard. He's got. Yeah. Well, yeah he Taylor, says that yeah, Taylor, Taylor is even more, I, I mean, technically better than him. You know, mm -hmm. he always says how how Taylor has all, and, and Taylor is. I mean, Taylor is very technically talented. You know, but Dave, he doesn't give himself credit. The fact that he's got like there's there's a song by um, what's the what's the, the them crooked vultures, right? Oh, uh, it, yeah. It's that one song on the album where he does he has that like drum fill intro, Bratton to doom, Bratton to doom to doom to doom, Bratton to doom, and it's like it's so groovy and on point. And, you know, th there's a lot to that. Like that, like that was, um, that intro was like very um, uh, 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 Steve Gaddish, right? Because like he does a lot of those, those flams and stuff. And it was just so good. You know, like. Oh, what about the, uh, what about the one he did with, um, uh, with uh, Josh Homme? What's that band? That was... well, them Crooked Vultures. Them, um, the other band with Queens Josh Homme. So yeah, Queens of Stone. Remember, remember he did that. Um, you know, yeah, yeah. All that stuff. Yeah. Oh man, he killed it. Killed it. Awesome. Yeah. He killed it, man. <laughs> well, he he almost played drums like a songwriter. Like his yeah. skills were were literally like riffs. Like he did everything in an exact spot the same way each time in a very signature kind of way. Yeah. Like you could tell he was doing like drum drum lines like an earworm. Yeah. And Sound City. Yeah. It's cool. Or tricky. Wasting Light. Did you guys ever see the Wasting Light documentary? Yep. No, I didn't see it. <clears throat> yeah, it's basically, you know, they get this 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 um old I, I think it was, right? was it was it wasn't an API sixteen oh eight or something? It was something it was something like it's expensive but modern and fo and small format. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they put it in his garage and they're just uh they're just doing you know like it's a documentary about them making the album and right they got amazing they, so they got the they got the soundboard out of sound city and so um it's a neve board uh yeah it, it's probably a 12 foot board 
And so that's what's in his recording studio now in, in, in 606. Yeah, in it's like this, it's like the old, like, me, like, 8068 or something. Like. Right. Mm. So, so, like, the pinnacle of Neve boards. And, and the whole documentary is really about the studio and the sound of the studio. You know, and they talk about how not only did you have that fantastic console, but you also had the room, which like, for some reason, the room was just amazing for recording drums in, you know, and. and well, that's where Tool did their, uh, their first record too. Tool did their first record, Rage Against the Machine, Nirvana, Nevermind. Uh, uh, Metallica uh, did it. Rat. Oh, I think I mentioned this before. The Rumors album, that was done there. And possibly yep. the other one, the other uh, album. Wow. Uh, and that Petty place was, is gone, huh? Tom Petty was in there all the time. Uh, you have to There's some really watch, nice videos it, of I Tool recording there. If, if you guys pay for uh, YouTube Premium, it's free on YouTube Premium, Premium the movie. <coughs> They have movies you can watch. So. And mm -hmm. and that that studio shut down? Gone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, at least you got the documentary, right? That's the main thing. Yeah. I wish there was a documentary about Electric Plant. You know? Oh, me too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I my friend Jeremy Bachelor did begin one. Um, maybe we'll maybe we could uh, nudge him to finish it. But um, yeah, so he has some footage, and I guess the idea would just be to get Brooklyn guys like us and to just talk about Vinny. I don't know how much inside the studio footage there is, but mm. it's I'll like- I'll never forget Electric Plant. I remember I was talking to, I was friends with Exit to Eternity because Rob Teague, the guitar player, was a janitor in my high school. Hmm. And we were playing this uh, this metal show, you know, this after, you know, we were playing this metal show and he happened to be working and he heard the guitar. So he came and he started talking to all of us. And, and uh, he told me that, you know, he was in a metal band and I saw him in the halls one day and he had his headphones and he goes, oh, dude, listen to this, you know? And I heard um, his, his, his four song. I mean, he only played a, a couple seconds of his, uh, of one of the songs from the four song EP, right? I said, dude, where did you record this? And he said, oh, I recorded this at, I'm an, I recorded this at Electric Plant. And I'm like, where the hell is that? And I look it up, you know, on like, um, map quest or something because mm -hmm. before we had everything in our phones because we're old um and it was like wait this is basically in canarsie it's like in my neighborhood <laughs> yeah but i had this dream that i went to electric plant and and it was like overlooking the water and everything was like these big glass windows you know i i and like these big gigantic rooms that's that's what i just <laughs> that's why i you know i just had the vision i just had the vision I'm in my head, you know? And when I got there, I was like, I smell mildew. And I go <laughs> up the stairs and you're in, you're in this little place, but man, did Vin know what to do in that place, huh? Yeah. He knew yeah. his equipment and he didn't mm -hmm. know how to work it, you know? Mm -hmm. I was blown away, man. Yeah. Blown yeah. away. Because I remember uh, they let they let me sit in when they mixed that song, Justice Under God. Um, and it was kind of like, a, it starts out kind of like a ballad and then it gets really heavy you know because they were really into slayer and stuff mm -hmm. and it's just playing through the playing through the speakers and i remember just like like really like i couldn't i couldn't wrap my head around it how good it sounded in there <laughs> it was the best set of speakers i've ever heard yeah. probably to this day he had a pair of atoms if i'm not wrong i think they were a pair of atoms really and he spent like he spent like two grand or three grand a piece on those on those yeah. speakers they were very expensive yeah Ooh, you bought like the a77x's or something they, like that they were they were they had these special cones on them they were they were something else and um yeah because he was spending money on his system he was he was you know uh using pro tools at that point mm -hmm. uh, he had bought some new preamps um he had those i believe they were atoms they were these big atoms yeah that place they, was magical man yeah. Did he yeah. end up selling everything off? I believe he did. Mm -hmm. I think he did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember uh, one one band I was in, District 22, in the year 2002 to 2003. We were together for only really one year. This was with uh, Dave Evans on drums and two other guys. And uh, we had access to the studio on Sundays because the bass player was working there part-time. 
And he, so Vinny wasn't open on Sunday. So he would allow us to go in and have ah, the studio to ourselves for like a amazing. discounted price. Nice. And uh, so we just had these like party Sundays and we're eating there and we were pretty respectful about keeping it clean, but we did leave it smelling like crap. I'm sure from all the cigarettes or smoking <laughs> weed or whatever, <laughs> but uh yeah. Oh, I mean, there was that was that was like my part of my rock star dream uh, being fulfilled, really, like just like this party atmosphere in this super cool place. And then I could go home afterwards. You know, I didn't need to have tons of people. We had our, our friends come over and everyone's hanging out and I'm playing with this really good band at the time. And uh, yeah, it was cool, man. And, uh, and it was walking distance to home. And yeah, I could walk, walk home if I had it's to. A, it's walking distance, <laughs> you know? Yeah. You had the oh, ice man. shop down the block, McDonald's right. across the street. Yep. Down the block, uh, yeah. It was fun. Yep. Ice is yeah. queen. <laughs> ice is queen. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. It I, almost... I, I pass it all the time. <laughs> right. It almost it, feels like it was like this um, oasis in the middle of nowhere, even yeah. though, of course, it's not true, but like my memory almost sees it like that, you know, because no, nothing else in the block besides the ice is queen. No, there were a few things, but a lot of it just seemed like. Did, does not compute you know like it, yeah. i just saw the studio and whenever place i can get food that was it yeah you know, you know I think that's a weird area because it's like kind of industrial you know right but it's also like you know there's like a lot of fast food so it's kind of like a main drag you know off utica yeah it's, it's a strange place um but uh yeah i passed by it i don't know yesterday or uh and yeah, I, would, I was with my wife and Yoko, and I was just telling her about some of those memories and stuff. I always do it. Sarah's so sick of hearing me say talk about it as we pass it. She goes, <laughs> you tell me this every time we pass it. I said, I know, but it's important. <laughs> right. important. <laughs> At least to me it is. Yeah. No, I do the same thing. She right. like, she's yeah. the same thing. Oh, you always say this. I'm like, and you're going to hear it again. <laughs> Listen, yeah. that building used to be blue. <laughs> is he still doing music? Vinny? Mm -hmm. no Last idea. time I spoke to Vinny, he was doing some, some, he was doing yeah. like um, uh, installing cameras mm -hmm. and stuff. Like security and system or something? Secure, security yeah, security company. systems. And then I heard, and then he, he was telling me one time he was doing like, he was um, doing like a stage man. He was a stage manager. Mm. So he was, so he was working, working live, you know. I think one of the last times I bumped into him was at the Tamaqua and he was playing with that police tribute band. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, arrested. He's a good guitar mm -hmm. player too. I remember I'd rarely ever seen him actually play, and the few times I did, I was like, "Oh, he's pretty good." Yeah, I have oh. a crazy story about that too. I remember when I was—I must have been like maybe fourteen years old or fifteen years old—and I went on Electric Planet. Dot, uh, I'm sorry, Electric Planet. Dot net. I think it was. I don't even think it was a dot com. I think it was a, 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 Electric Planet Studios. Dot net. And I, and I was cycling through the pictures and I saw a picture of this guy uh, with, with an electric plant shirt. And I was like, oh, so this must be Vincent. He looks pretty cool. It was actually Lou. It was a picture of Lou. Oh, sexy. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. It was a picture had an electric Lou. plant shirt. But yeah. he had and you the were there. You were there with your glasses, with your hat, you know, and you, you had like a beautiful, like, you know, 2000s pencil line beard. Mm. I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't now, know we're that. now we're talking. Chris knows. <laughs> <laughs> Chris knows. Yeah, but but I was like, I was like, wow, man, this uh, this electric plant guy is a, you know, he's a good looking guy. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> uh, so just want to say shout out to Tom Tom Scuderi, who's uh, also just gave us a lot of info about um, Taylor Hawkins and Dave Grohl and. Yes, uh, I, it's not official whether Dave Grohl can growl, but we do know that Dave Grohl is pretty awesome. Uh, <laughs> Man of many talents. You gotta make a poll, John. <laughs> right. You know? Yeah. Can Dave, does Grohl growl? Question mark. Yes or no? Grohl. Mm, or me? You can do that. <laughs> yeah, you can so, do that. So, uh, so, Chris, I have another question for you. Um, what would you say the genres that you have played in most frequently as a drummer? Frequently. So, okay, I've been playing with these guys here in the neighborhood and we do a lot of cover songs. So we do a few Alice in Chains songs. Um, uh, we're doing some 
uh, Black Sabbath songs, whatnot. And writing wise, it's mainly rock. The other band I'm in, the, the Flowered Gnomes, seems like, uh, and Lou's heard the, the demo we did, mm -hmm. uh, is a very 70s ish rock band. Nice. Um, <laughs> although the bass player is metal and I tend to gravitate towards heavier drums, although I like playing funk. Um, so the music started getting, even though the guitar player is still like very seventies, you know, he's from that era. Um, it's still, it's sort of getting like a little dark, but seventies. It was, it was interesting to say the least. Yeah. And before nice. that, I guess your genres were primarily, would you say metal or hard rock, metal, funk, um, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I guess I guess that's that's mainly what I what I play mostly rock, rock, metal, play. funk, yeah. and yeah, basically rock, yeah, yeah, and with a little bit of prog in there too, I suppose, like mixing yeah, it up a little bit. Um, so now that since I have Lou and and Chris together, what what genre would you say would you say Mr. Jack Frost was? It was like a funk hawk, hard rock band. It was rock. Um, I think I'd say experimental. Experimental. Is that what Dave Schwinzicki on bass? No, no, TJ. Uh, TJ. Oh, TJ, and uh, and that was when you were JT Smooth. No, 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 that was that was in Caden. That was <laughs> my <laughs> alter ego. I just, to see Chris, I just wanted to see Chris's face. <laughs> you, you remember JT Smooth? <laughs> Dean Demarco. That was the other one. Oh wow. yeah, Dean Demarco was the Mister Jack Dean Frost. Uh, oh, Dean Demarco. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I like that. JT Smooth, FDA. What was it? FDA approved? What is it? <laughs> oh, man. Listen, he had a name too down there. Oh, me? Oh, yeah, you did. <laughs> what name was that? Yeah, yeah. What name was that? I know what name that is. You know what name that is. <laughs> Why don't you tell no me your name? I have no recollection. Why don't you tell me your name? <laughs> This is it's funny because I still use the name. <laughs> All right. See? See? He's yeah. admitting it. He yeah. had a name. I still use it because, like, you know, if if someone comes up to you who you don't know, and you know, you get these people in the street who they'll be like really personal. Hey man, how you doing? Hey, you know, my name is Steve. Uh, I give him my fake name. You know, hey, I'm Dominic Stuccio. You know, hey, Dominic. Hey, <laughs> there you uh, go. So, uh, uh, I still use it. I use it all uh, the time. Stuccio. <laughs> 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 that's good man i like it yeah. it's 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 believable yeah well, he does look like dom. Dom Stuccio. <laughs> funny, <laughs> funny so thing, dom. the name actually comes from two different stories um i hate the name chris i christopher <laughs> i hate that name oh. i wanted i wish i was named dominic i, I actually wanted to change my name at one you point. look like a dominic yeah i can give you that thanks i i, I really did i wanted to change my name at one hey, point Stuccio is gonna make you a pizza so then, Lou, you probably remember Mike Stuccio. Mike Stuccio. He was, Mike Stuccio was a member of the Knights of Columbus. So he lived on Mike Baker's block. Remember where he lived? Mm -hmm. on 38th Street? Okay. So a few times, it happened like three or four times, as I'm just walking, minding my own business. One time, this girl... Uh, stopped me and she was like Mike and I just looked at her and said Chris and she went Mike and I said Chris <laughs> and she goes are you related to Mike Stuccio and I said I don't even know who that is so that was one another it happened like three or four times um, so <laughs> I finally met the Stuccio the Stuccio and, and I didn't think I looked like him at all so when it came, so when we were making fun of each other and making fake names, that's the name I came up with because I wanted to be called Dominic and I kept on being confused for the Stuccio. That's nice. Uh, was he the Stuccio? Absolutely. Because, you know, I was just, I was just writing the coattails of that, mm -hmm. of that name. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Nice. I, I think Dominic the Stuccio. Dominic. Oh man. Oh. <laughs> oh man. So, so quick sidebar, uh, Lou. Um, 
So mm-hmm. just in the timelines here. So uh, before Mr. Jack Frost was Nysteria, is that right? Yes. That was the, that was the first thing I, I think I ever done. Was okay. Nysteria. So that was basically uh, level six without me. And who it was another, with another guy, right? Because it was you, Justin, Lou. You, you are Lou, sorry. You, <laughs> Justin, TJ. It was me, Justin, Lou, TJ, and Mike Pomeri. Okay, yeah, so it was. So that um, started with Pomeri, and then the first show we ever did was with you in it. So the first show we ever mm-hmm. did was actually level six. Like, I don't know, what is that, five years ahead? Is yeah, something ahead? like that, right? Mm-hmm. In Staten Island, and you would... You would say that was 99 or something like that? The Dock Street? No, it was like 98, I think. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't think we were out yet, out of high school. Uh, mm. You were senior year, because I, I know I graduated in 99. Yeah, so I graduated in 98. So, right, it could have been. Uh, that was still in... level six. That was Frost. No, it was it was Nystaria. Oh, oh, but you said it was level six. Because he it was the same guys in level oh, six. The same band. Um. Yeah, that was the first show I had ever done. That was at the Wave in Staten Island. The Wave, wow! And I'd Vex. love to, f- I'd love to get the dates on that. I remember October Thorns played there, so it would have been, if anything, it would have been uh, late '98. If it's '98, yeah, because we I knew Dave the, Z already. We were the second stage, and the main stage had October Thorn and uh, October Thorns and Vex in it. And I think that I think Carpenter was in that variation of October Thorns. Yes, I was oh, yeah. at that show. Oh, were you? Yeah. Could you you think you could place it in time, Chris? Like it was year it season. Was definitely around ninety eight. Ninety eight. That sounds about right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So late ninety eight. Late ninety eight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, it was cold. We took. I was in fourth grade. Wow. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Is that real? You were in fourth grade. <laughs> wow. My God. Somebody, this dude's like sixteen years old. Get him <laughs> a, a nippy. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> Does your mom know you're up right now? <laughs> <laughs> you're old enough to be in the Zoom call. <laughs> I should have got a sign permission, parental permission. <laughs> uh, four. Wow. Man, no, fourth grade. Maybe 88. Yeah, 88 yeah. was a great year uh, for many, uh, many reasons. That, that felt like a punch right in the gut. <laughs> right. When you're younger, you want to be older. But then when you're older, you want to be younger. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, if I can go back in time, I wouldn't want to be older anymore. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. If you had an idea of what's coming, yeah. Like, I like to stay, like, 25 was a good year. It was a good age. 26. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. The yeah. wave show. You're laughing at over there. <laughs> You know who would probably now? I'm falling apart here, Lou. <laughs> uh, you know, talk about falling apart. You know who would probably remember the Wave <laughs> show in detail? Probably uh, Dave Pando, right? Mm. He, yeah, he might. He probably put it together. Hmm. Yeah. He, he used to. He was, uh, he was in the band. He was in October Thorns at that point. He was, yeah. was he mostly promotion, or he was mostly in bands and promoting? Because. I used to think he was like strictly a promoter. Then I found out he was in bands, but he wasn't in a lot of them. Like, yeah, it's kind of mixed. More seem more towards the promo side, but I think he was really want to be in a band too. So, mm-hmm. yeah, <clears throat> um, yeah. I, I saw some emails from as I was going back. Jason Hills uh, found all these old emails that he gave me access to uh so from 2001 there was this like email with modus tones following up on a gig at lamore and uh with dave pando and apparently uh there's a whatever some discrepancy with lamore about getting paid and what, what else is new right of course. and uh <laughs> and um but so he was kind of acting as an intermediary for lamore at that time and um yeah, so I think I mentioned this before, but Lou, so you played, Mr. Jack Frost played at Lemoore December 15th, uh, 2000. Yeah, December 15th, 2000, with Mr. Jack Frost played and Modus Tones played that night too. And then one other band that we know, and CO2, 
uh, pre ZO2 band with me? Paul Easy. It's in the email like uh, that you guys were on the plate. So I vaguely remember <laughs> that Mr. Jack Frost played, I think you guys went nine, nine, then Motor Stones played at 10. And I, that was the first gig with Amir, the saxophone player, and, uh, Wait, I and, and Andy. That. First gig I, with Andy, the, our new I, singer. I think Gene used like this microphone that made your sax player sound like it was a kazoo. <laughs> like, <laughs> the old Gene. I don't want to say it that way, but I think I might remember that night because I think I remember playing with Modus Tolens one time. And that was one of the nights I went after Gene afterwards because. I felt like the sound was absolutely horrendous for everybody. There were a few times I went after Gene. Yeah, like, he, pretty bad. He was very nasty, especially to us. <laughs> we played. I know we played Thank there you. a lot, and we were naive and young. But like, he wasn't. Instead of instead of like guiding you through, like, oh, this is what you should do, or you know, try it this way. He was just. He would just belittle you. You know. Mm -hmm. So. You know, he he wasn't like you know. I don't know. He wasn't the nicest of guys. Yeah, well, let's leave his last name out of it, just for uh, yeah to be no. kind. But uh, but in in all fairness, I, I do remember a similar type of thing uh, growing up, for sure. Uh, and then later on in recent years, I encountered Gene at a at a common common cause. Right, uh, it was uh, at a Dave Z memorial thing. And mm -hmm. he was wailing out and he was supporting the cause. And afterwards, I felt like this like historical, like we're not friends for some reason. I don't I had no idea why, you know, just like this kind of something sometimes that those, those things happen, right? Like you don't know why that you got a weird energy with someone. There's nothing personal that happened between us. And I just told him, Hey, that was great guitar playing. He's like, Oh, thanks, John. Like, he knew my name. And like, he was like very, very complimentary towards me, you know, like asking me a question and, you know, who knows, you know, sometimes when these unspoken things happen between people, if you feel these energy and just break the ice, you can just immediately have a connecting point. I'm sure I have much more in common with him than I don't, you know, coming up in Brooklyn, being guitar player and the whole thing, you know? Yeah. I think that could be said about most of us. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I but I, I have the similar memories, you know, we all had unpleasant sound experiences playing live right with yeah. sound yeah. men who were or weren't cooperative At one show whenever it was it was just uh it was distorted and i, and I don't understand like I, like i do a lot of live sound too now so i know i understand the equipment's been updated so he definitely 20 years ago wasn't using what I, what we're using but i i just even looking back at that now i'm like there's really not that much of an excuse for that there is like, you know <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. If you're an engineer, you know, which you're supposed to be doing engineering, you should know how to get around those those pitfalls, right? Right. It, it wasn't as though it was clear, but it could have been mixed better. It just some of those shows just didn't sound good. Like and then when his band came up, they always sounded good. Right. <laughs> so it was like, OK, this place has the potential of sounding good. <laughs> Where, where's the problem? Yeah, no, I, I, I remember. Typo played there. They sounded amazing. Well, they brought in their own guy. I right, don't. I don't think Gene ever mixed them. But but that's what I'm. That's my point. We we so when we were with um, uh, um, just one chance, uh, the early days, um, when Vincent still had Electric Plant, um, he, we would pay him to do our sound at Electric at uh at Lemoore's because, mm. you know, again. I don't know if he just remembered us from being in Frost because, you know, me and Andrew were both in Frost mm -hmm. and, and um, it was, it was awful. So we used to give like Vinny a hundred bucks for the night and he would come do our sound. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. I'm sure it sounded way better than the. Sounded great. We sounded, we sounded great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you guys, uh, do you guys remember playing third rail? Third rail oh, was that's the loading the dock the for the Third rail. We used to play there all the time. Yes. Yeah. See, I I, I kind of missed Lemores. I was like, mm. I had just missed it because it you know it closed. Uh, but we used to play Third Rail, which was a loading dock for Lemores. Yeah. And you know that place was cool because it had a built-in crowd. You know, mm -hmm. 
people would come. It was all ages. People would come, you know, and, and that place was very hard to get the sound to work because everything was all concrete. It was all cement, cement floors, cement walls. Everything would bounce. But I, I have to say, it was even though everything would bounce, the guys did a good job. Yeah. Yeah. I never had any complaints. Yeah. You know? <clears throat> right. Yeah, and live sound is just incredibly hard and very easy. There's so many pitfalls and so many, <laughs> you know, there's so many ways things can go wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Especially when you're working on, you know, like, you know, like you think about it nowadays, people bring a digital mixer that has all their built in effects and, it, and, and everything's autumn, you know, you, you could automate things, you could save scenes, you know, you could save like all the settings in, in one shot. You use you know, back in the days in analog, you. you couldn't do it. You had to, you had to just, you had to bring racks and racks of gear. You know, yeah. and Lou's, Lou's, Lou's thinking about work now because uh, <laughs> that's. Well, what I knew does. what he was talking about. The M32. I carry the scenes on my USB key, but um, yeah, that's amazing. Uh, one of the rooms I'm mixing in almost every other day is all glass. Wow. So I I understand. I, I've so learned, what do you have to do? You have I've to take a new appreciation for live sound. You have to EQ out all the, the feedback resonances? All of them. Mm -hmm. Parametrics. You have to use a parametric. But um, yeah, you got to push the volume, find it, then push the volume again, find it, push the volume again, and you just have to keep going up little by little. Um, so yeah, three of them. Three of them, it's all glass. And then I think there's only one treated room I mix it. That's about it. But a total of seven stages. It's really cool, man. But it's different in every room. Every mm -hmm. single room. Now now being confronted with acoustics, like smack in the face, I'm starting to realize, you know, it, it's a puzzle. And uh, sound isn't always going to be good. Dependent upon atmospheric conditions, depending upon how many people are in the room, what the volume has to go to. You, there's, there's not always saving it. But that being said, some of the memories I do have from years ago, there were some inexcusable mistakes done. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Like yeah. distortion when speakers weren't blown. Right. <laughs> Just lower right. the gain. Exactly. <laughs> like, simple. <laughs> yeah. But, but, you know, it's, uh, but it's interesting. It's definitely interesting because you could read a textbook as many times as you like and you can see what it says and go, oh, you know, it's going to sound like this. So this is going to reflect under this condition. And you don't realize it until you're thrown in it at 110 decibels in front of like hundreds of people. And you're like, okay, I could rip everybody's ears out right now mm -hmm. with feedback if I do the wrong thing. And uh, yeah, it's interesting. Experience is the best teacher, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. like Especially I said, Especially when you're thrown into the fire. Certainly. Chris is going to come train with me. Yep. Oh, that'd be great. Are you? <laughs> so guys, I'm going to ask Chris a question that's um, slightly uh, on the philosophical side. You think we could all handle that? We're all big boys, right? Do you believe in aliens? No. So um, <laughs> we know the answer to that, I think. <laughs> uh, so, so Chris, what is one, hmm, I'm going to throw two questions at you. Let me start with one. Uh, what aspect of your life philosophy helps you recover from setbacks or what is your life philosophy? You, you're generally positive guy. You're upbeat person. Nice to be around. I think most people regard you as a cool guy. Uh, so what keeps you like that? Um, I think what keeps me like that is like, I, I never pass my, like if I, something goes wrong, I don't really, I don't pass my blame onto anybody else. I, I internalize everything. And um, in doing so, I always say to myself, well, how could, how could I do this better next time, right? So if, if, if something happens, if a situation happens and it's not right, I'm always like, well, you know, sure, so-and-so could have done this to make the situation better or so-and-so could have done this. But I'm always like, well, what could I, like, instead of looking at it that way, I'm like, what could I have done, you know, to, to make the situation better? I'm always trying to find... Because I feel like passing blame on to something just leads you back to the same place you were originally. So um, I, I always feel that, you know, think about what happened and, and learn from it. Really, I, I mean, you learn that when you're a kid, right? 
learn from your mistakes. So, and, and I really try not to get angry at it, you know, uh, <laughs> and, and, and just correct it for the next time round. So. Wow. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't have, uh, I wouldn't have known what you would say, but now that you explain your philosophy in that terms that I could see how that does uh, fit your character, you know? And um, yeah. So basically, I don't know if you're saying hundred percent responsibility, but it kind of sounds like that taking hundred, but hundred percent responsibility for your own so the, actions, so the, reactions. I can give you an example. Um, when I had started, when I was with my company for maybe like, I think I was only there for like two years. Um, something, I was working in the mailroom and something had happened. Uh, one of the big wigs packages wasn't delivered or lost. Uh, we were like, we were like corporate messengers and, and mailroom. So like we only worked for that one company. Um, and I, I was a hundred percent sure it wasn't my fault, although I was catching blame for it. And the guy who I was pretty sure was his fault. He has like, he had like five kids, you know? So I told my boss, I said, you know, I'll, listen, I'll take the blame. You know, don't let this other guy take the blame. I'll take the blame. I got, I got nothing, you know? So if they're going to, if they're going to let go of somebody, I'll, I'll take it, you know? And um, it turns out that uh, my boss now was interested in hiring me for this other position. So they didn't really blame anybody. No one got in trouble. And I wound up moving to this other job anyway. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, just sometimes it's easier to just say, you know, screw it. I'm going to take the blame. And let's just, instead of arguing about who did what, let's just, let's just get this over with. Let's figure it out. Mm -hmm. You know? So. That's yeah. It's, it's a great attitude, man. And, and I think sometimes when we put ourselves out there and say to the universe, okay, let me be the, uh, not, not the sacrificial lamb, but let me, let me, uh, let me be the bigger man here type of thing. Yeah. Then the universe just says, okay, bigger man, we got the next job, the next response role for you. And it's, it's usually better than, than when you were coming from, you know? Right. The universe right. Re respects response to that energy. So, yeah, I don't want to bicker about anything. I just want to get, uh, I do that at work now. Wow. Well, you know, my, my, uh, upper, upper boss, he's, very strict and very thorough and everything. Um, and even now I'll just be like, I, I did it. I don't, I don't care. I'll take the, I don't care. I'll take the blame. I'll fix it. I'll get it done. And that's, you know, that's what I do. I'm like the go-to fix it person in my, in my office. So, but um, yeah. Wow. Uh, all right. Maybe uh, about one more question. And then I guess I'll let you guys get some rest. Cause I know you all are responsible people that need your beauty sleep <clears throat> um <laughs> so uh all right so one more question chris uh, and and then we'll you could all chime in on this too please since uh, our lovely and very attractive co-hosts are here with us um uh so are there any setbacks that you'd feel comfortable to share <laughs> in which you've learned a powerful life lesson if music plays into it that's great um I think you kind of just did share one, but you know, something like to encourage people, you know, the, the uh, lockdown seems like we're coming to some warmer spring breeze of like, you know, freedom now, but uh, still maybe people are still depressed from this past year. And like, what kind of encouraging thing you, could you share from maybe a setback and how you overcame it type of thing? Uh, so dealing with, with, COVID especially, I mean, everything is going to get better, you know, uh, places are going, everything's going to be reopening again. Um, you know, uh, like I said, pre COVID right before COVID, uh, band I was with, we were starting to play a lot of shows and it was, you know, it was, it was becoming a lot of fun. We had recorded a three song demo and we were excited and then COVID hit and, and everything just went. So, um, everything's going to get better. Um, but as far as setbacks goes, um, so I'm dealing with, I'm dealing with an issue that's, that's, uh, it's probably going to be lifelong. And um, 
uh, I'm going deaf in my right ear. Um, and, it, and it's a disease that causes, uh, I was supposed to visit Lou in Nashville um, a, a couple of weeks ago and I had to cancel last minute. Um, and I'm, I, and the, the issue is persisting where it's called Meniere's disease. And, uh, and it causes very bad bouts of vertigo and I have permanent hearing loss in this year. Eventually it will go completely deaf. Um, and I, just from playing, so as a, as a playing standpoint, um, I always have, my, have to ask my bass player, play on my left side. I, you know, I need to hear you, I need, I need you on my left side. And anybody who plays on my right, mm, I'm not really going to hear you. Um, and I've adapted in certain ways where now, uh, so when we're writing something, I don't play. I shut off my snare wires, I make sure my hi-hat is closed, and while they're all playing, I'm listening. And while I'm listening, I'm counting and I'm watching their hands. Um, and so now when I am playing, especially whoever's on my right side, I'm watching their hands and I'm counting, I'm playing, and, I, and, and I'm just like, I'm making sure I'm in time because the rhythm and the rhythm guitar player that I'm playing with here in the neighborhood plays on my right side. And uh, the, the Flowered Gnomes, my other band, um, the guitar player is always on my right side. And so I, I've, I've been learning this whole, like just looking at everyone's hands thing. Live shows is another, is another uh, thing altogether. So, cause I'm not, you know, no one's facing each other. Everyone's facing the crowd. So the live show I'm playing and they just have to keep up with me, you know? So I'm just locking in. I'm making sure. So like when I'm, when I'm at my kit here, my uh, electronic kit, I'm making sure that I'm playing to the click and I have the music, I have all this, the music stored on the thumb drive. So I'm playing to a click, I'm playing the songs. And so when we play live, it's like I'm playing here, you know? And it's, it's you know, cause I'm not really, you know, everything's not what it should be. So it's something I've had to kind of overcome. Um, and it's affected me now because it's, I haven't really, been, I haven't been able to practice because I've become like audio sensitive, kind of like how you could be light, like photo sensitive, but audio sensitive. Sometimes this ear, I just can't handle loud sounds. And as a drummer, I mean, everything's loud, you know? So um, it's, it's becoming a challenge. So mm. uh, we'll see where this goes, but don't, you know, there's ways to overcome everything and you know, if it's a passion, you will, you, you know, like I'm finding a way, I will find a way, you know, to keep it going. So. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Very de definitely inspirational. Uh, reminds me of two things. Um, one is like, is what's the Marines motto? Something like adapt and overcome or something like yeah. that, yeah. that type yeah. of idea. Yeah. And, uh, and then Beethoven, right? Beethoven, one of the most well-regarded, highly regarded composers of all time, slowly, he actually slowly went deaf in his thirties. And I certainly hope that that won't happen, complete deafness. But if, if it is degenerative, that you will find some sort of way that you can make it work for you, because we still regard Beethoven as one of the greatest composers. And some of his best pieces were written in complete deafness. Mm. So it's very interesting to know that. Um, so thanks for sharing that, Chris. Um, before we close, uh, Josh, Lou, I, I have one small uh, setback thing I could share. Uh, either of you guys have something you guys want to share in terms of setbacks that you've overcome or you're in the process of overcoming, you know, kind of leave us off on a high note. Uh, Josh, you can go first. Um, I would say, um, I would say, you know, I always have a hard time like remembering complicated arrangements I, it's always, it's always hard, you know, to try to, and sometimes you can count things out and you go, okay, this is going to be eight bars. This is going to be 16 bars, stuff like that. But um, lately I just been feeling the only way to really do it is if you practice enough and uh, you just get the muscle memory, you know, where you don't really have to think about the arrangement because your hands are going to kind of do what they did for the last couple months you know, so I feel like um, I try to write things in a way that my muscle memory will be able to take hold of, you know, 
so mm -hmm. I can kind of clear my head to think about uh, the stuff in the music, the variables in the music that you have to face for that day. Like, let's say you're um, you're playing a gig and your drum seat is kind of wobbly, you know, <laughs> so that's going to be a setback. But the muscle memory will take over so you can kind of use your brain power to focus on the uh, the variables of the night. <laughs> If that makes any sense, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah, that, so that, that shows me that you really you're focused on the bigger picture, you know, and you want to continually grow and work with your own what you perceive limitations. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's like it's like you just you just want you know. I I try to use the same thing in the studio too. It's like I try to have everything laid out and have the engineering like almost out of the way, you know. So you can focus on the music. So you don't fall into the same little pitfalls and little problems that you would fall into if you were trying to juggle everything at once. You know, have, mm -hmm. in other words, I try to have some things on autopilot. And, uh, and in terms of playing, I try to have the set on autopilot just so I could focus on everything else. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I totally relate. Whenever I'm doing Facebook Lives nowadays, because I don't play live permit much, but... I try to play this, this set a few times and then because Facebook Live, I'm like some sort of technical issue where someone's talking or my son's running by and the mic, I'm like thinking a lot of things that, or I'm just in a bad mood. I'm like, damn, I don't, I want to be in a good mood right now, but I'm not. So I just yeah. like sing, you know, and I just play because I could trust that I did it a few, several times before. It's just going to come out and I could, I could entertain, which is what I wanted to do, even though I don't, I kind of would rather be just sleeping or something at that moment you know <laughs> yeah makes sense man yeah right makes sense there's a lot of variables thrown at us at once so we have to be able to um you know just deal with them in a in the most um a logistical way you know yeah yeah thanks for sharing uh, and I also remember just a fun fact uh, in the end of the marching marshmallows video which josh is in that video one of my songs um <laughs> You, you, we, we have a joke period and Joe, I mean, Josh says like, I forgot, I forgot the parts of, I forgot the song or I forgot the arrangement of something. You actually said it. And <laughs> exactly. Uh, that funny. sounds like me. <laughs> <laughs> and we included that, but it, it's great. It's great. Cause that's just like, that's your vibe and Hey, you, you're owning it. Right. So it's, it's wonderful. Uh, <laughs> so um, Lou, what about you? Any setbacks that you feel comfortable sharing now? than that you have overcome or in the process of overcoming oh man oh yeah uh i guess it's a message to, to anyone who's uh kind of been affected by all the shutdowns and all the other stuff you know i would i would say that uh, me and chris have spoken about that concept time and time again you know taking responsibility for things and going forward and uh you know the covid shutdowns and all that stuff really like put a hamper on a lot of things and made a lot of things super difficult and actually put a stop to numerous things. I think uh, if you remember, I was like getting ready to move to Utah last March. And like, that was like my, my way of my last step towards like a career. And um, yeah, since then, since the beginning of the shutdown, I mean, uh, me and Chris started the cafe and me and you started doing the music philosophy and more stuff. And uh, I don't know, my message is just keep, uh, keep trucking forward keep pushing forward. Uh, I was given an option last November to kind of like, uh, you know, get off of the unemployment or stay on it uh, and move forward. And I made a move to like get off of it and move forward. And now I find myself in a total different situation than I did before, but career wise, nonetheless, uh, you know, I'm kind of back on my feet. Uh, I didn't exactly picture the situation I'm in, which is arguably potentially better than it would have been had the other option panned out. So, um, yeah, I think it's very positive. Things have been kind of fallen into place. I've become somewhat comfortable again. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, to anyone who's been like really affected by everything, just keep keep looking forward. Keep your eyes on the prize, you know. You know, Lou, I thought you were going to say the biggest setback is being so ridiculously good looking and having to do live sound. Oh, well, Lou, that, you, well, you know, I'm not good at sound, so <laughs> that's why I'm there. <laughs> Lou, if you don't mind me uh, uh, speaking on your behalf as well, like sure. you did a massive reset like seven or eight years ago where 
you completely left New York and everything behind to go to school and like completely reset everything, you know, where you went to school for, for a couple of years and, and learned a new craft, did very well. And then, you know, went to Nashville and, and totally restarted your com life completely over where you could have stayed in New York and had any, you know, had jobs and, and worked a nine to five or, and you didn't want to do that. You wanted to do your own thing. And you, I think what you did is one incredibly hard and brave and, you know, all right, COVID kind of screwed everything up, like you said, but I mean, you did it, you know, you did it and you overcame that challenge. So thank uh, you, man. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, I'm, uh... And you are incredibly handsome. <laughs> Look at that face. Yeah. That I just face. feel like, uh, and I think John Henry agrees with it. You know, I'm very much into self evolution and I think that we're all here for a learning purpose. And I think that to, uh, to do things that you don't enjoy doing or wasting your life. Like a lot of people don't think taking a career job and being comfortable is wasting your life. But when you spend 80 years until retirement and then your retirement's traveling the world with a cane for whatever you could afford, that's not really living life. I mean, so, you know, I decided that whatever was in front of me wasn't worth it anymore. And it's time, it was time to get uncomfortable. And, uh, you know, luckily I, I landed on my feet a couple of times now. So yeah, just, uh, I don't want to give that speech. Like, you know, you could do anything, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> got to try. Um, yep. so I'm glad that everyone... yeah, I'd like to second Chris's notion really that, um, yeah, seeing you remembering how Lou was in Brooklyn towards the last few years of his stay, in, your stay in Brooklyn, Lou, you were not happy with it. And then we, you know, your friends would have known that and you got out and then you re, uh, what's what, redefined yourself or like recreated yourself a few times, you know, since then. And that's the COVID thing was another one of them where this happened. And so you got in the habit of rolling with the punches, you know, going into the unknown, rec recreating something, then finding ground and losing it, then recreating it, you know, a few times. And, uh, I think we, all of us have done that to some extent, um, being creative people and just human beings, but yeah, so that I think, you know, if, if just the fact, you know, what, what, what is it like uh, victory is, is that you get knocked down nine times and get up 10, you know, that that's really the, mm -hmm. the main point, you know, of, of life is that you're, you're willing to challenge it. That That's kind of the key, right? And yeah. that's, that's what your attitude is. So I think I was kind of, not, not that I was ready for the whole shutdown, but I had a feeling because we started the podcast pretty early, like right after it happened, I kind of had a feeling like, all right, this isn't going to end tomorrow. So let's just start rolling with things now and let's just start going. And I think you remember in the beginning, I was like, you want to do it again Monday? You want to do it again Monday? You want to do it Tuesday? Okay. <laughs> and just I, kept, would... just kept pushing. Which is funny because I was like in the I was in the other camp where I'm like this is gonna be two weeks I'm gonna be back to the office, and this is gonna you know because like we had other pandemics or other big things that like uh, um, what was the other one SARS there was swine flu right and we didn't shut down N1H1 we didn't mm -hmm. shut down we didn't do any of this and people died you know and and uh, so I thought I was like hey, well I'll be back to work in a week two weeks you know I didn't think anything of it and. You know, I'm still working from home. So, yeah, this one was different. Yeah. So, I'll just like to share one of my setbacks uh, briefly. And I think I actually forget which one I'm going to share. Oh, okay. So, um, which is, uh, so I like to jog. Um, I'm a walker. I'm a jogger. I'm not a, uh, a, what's the word, um, competitive runner or anything like that, but I like to run. Uh, and I like the fact that I, I evolved to the point where I like to run because I always wanted to run, but I was just kind of, I don't know about too lazy or whatever growing up, but it just wasn't easy. But now I'm at to the point where if I don't, I, I, I'm jonesing for it. You know, I really want to run. Um, and unfortunately, in the past two or three years, it started happening to the point where it just got, didn't get better. I thought I could work it out. But anyway, my knee hurts. I have knee, chronic knee pain. And then I went, finally went to a doctor, got an MRI and, and uh, 
whatever, and was found to have a, a, a torn meniscus, who knows how, who knows why. And uh, so I was putting it off, like, I looked it up, you could still jog with it, it's got to be less aggressive. And, you know, I can't jog for as long or as often. Um, and then I started, I said, you know what, it, it stinks, because I kneel when I pray. And I also I'm playing with my son a lot. So I'm, when I'm kneeling, it hurts. So I said, I'm going to try physical therapy because it's, it's one of the possibilities. So I went to my first physical therapy session the other day and I don't know, it seems like it could make a difference. I don't know if it's going to, but I figure what I'm going to do is just keep trying things until something works. You know, I'm not going to buy a line that someone tells me that, okay, well, it's just going to get worse or you're not going to be able to do the things you want to do. Mm -hmm. I'm going to keep looking until whether I find a way that works or find new things that I can do. But anyway, I jogged today and it felt good. You know, I, I did 35 minutes and I didn't, uh, I wasn't aching afterwards any more than I used to. Uh, so anyway, I'm not giving up hope and, uh, you know, I'm just going to be gentle and just approach it from a very non-competitive, I'm doing it for my health type of thing. Rest more if I need to you know, like this kind of adapt and overcome, like also I have tinnitus sucks. Every single morning I wake up, it's just this loud noise in my ear. Mm. I'm like, oh, and uh, you know, yeah. And it, you, you are not alone, you know? And you know, if you research any of that, it is not very hopeful in terms of like it getting better, but I just try to not overthink it. Like, okay, mm. this is the experience I'm having right now, you know? But usually as the day goes on, the sounds of the day, you know, come and I notice it, but in the silence, it, you know, it's very noticeable. So I've noticed that if you, um, if you stay away from loud noises long enough, it, it will slightly get better. And uh, it definitely flares if you're in a loud area and it'll be enhanced for a bit and then goes back down. Um yeah, but you have to be a, away from loud things. And I would say you live in New York, so that's virtually impossible. But if you stay away from sheer volume for a while and uh, not by wearing earplugs, because that could end up being more damaging. Um, if you could just be around like room noise, it, mm -hmm. it, it kind of subsides a bit or your subconscious just adjusts a little better and you, and you can kind of like, oversee it but but i don't know uh, new york's just loud by nature so it's almost impossible to you know car horns and beeping and yelling and it's just the noise level there is absurd it is well marine park is is not as bad as some parts but um yeah no it, cool yeah i appreciate that uh i have um, i have a good doctor for meniscus so really? Uh, I didn't get it done by him, but um, I don't know if you know Justin, the big red guy. He's a cop, he's a cop now. Um, Maybe. Anyway, he was asking me for a doctor, and I sent him to this doctor by me. Um, he and he did his knee, and he was like, "My knee is like brand new." So he told a friend who works for the Department of Transportation. He got his knee done. And then sent 30 other DOT guys to get their knees done by wow. this doctor. And they all had great experiences. So mm -hmm. he helped me. I went to him. I had a pain under here. And it was weird because I, I didn't do anything to like or understand how he could have a pain under here. And he goes, I think it's your neck. I said, my neck? He goes, mm -hmm. I think it's your neck. So sure enough. I did an MRI and I have like a bit of degenerative uh, disc disease in my neck. And so um, I did physical therapy and which wound up like you do all these head exercises and motions and you do some strengthening of the neck. And um, sure enough, the pain went away. So he's a very good doctor. So if you're interested, you know, cool. Yeah. yeah, I'll bear that in mind. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm hopefully not going to surgery anytime soon. I'm going to hold out about 10 years if I can. But uh, but yeah, definitely it's good to know. I'm fairly happy with my knee doctor, but I'm always happy to hear yeah. about good recommendations. 
Yeah. All right, guys. Um, so what do you think? Can we tentatively say next Monday, we'll kind of hang out again, maybe bring some questions, no pressure. If you can't do it, no problem, but, uh, sure. no, I'm, I'm available. Yeah. Sounds cool. good. Yeah. And we'll call yep. it the, the Brooklyn guys hang out or whatever. I'm in. I like it. We'll we'll do top, top five albums or top five, whatever we, we could figure out something fun. Sounds great, man. So thank yeah. you, Chris, for, for allowing, uh, our good buddies to, uh, yeah, to no, drop in on our party. Me on. I, I really enjoyed this. Uh, and for these two guys joining, uh, Josh, I haven't seen you. I love you. I miss you. I, love, I miss you too, man. I was so nice, so nice to hang out with you, man. Yeah, man. Yeah. So oh, I wish we could do a group hug. We could do a virtual hug. Come here. <laughs> Bring it in. Bring it in. <laughs> awesome. All right. So I think uh, I'll let you go. And, uh, Thank you, everyone, for listening. Shout out to Tom Scuderi for so many wonderful yeah. questions and uh, hanging out with us and Darlene and whoever else was there. And uh, we'll see you next Monday. Uh, I'm going to say 8 o'clock, and then we'll discuss with the boys if that works for everyone uh, next Monday. All right, Josh, Chris, Lou, thank you so much. Thank Focus you, guys. On. Thank you. Great, a great night. Great hanging out with you guys. Night. Absolutely. Likewise. Yeah. Take it easy. <laughs>